once again to the Horror Cult Films Podcast. I'm David Smith, and joining me tonight are Mr. Jim Lamming and Alistair Yule. Hello, gents! Hello! Hello. Tonight, we visit the little town of Burkittsville and talk about the Blair Witch Trilogy. The original changed the face of our genre. No, it was not the first found footage. It's probably something like Cannibal Holocaust, but it was the single biggest found footage. Two sequels later, and we have an interesting, if inconsistent, franchise. But hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've been watching plenty of other things too, so why the heck don't we start by talking about them, huh? Al, what have you been watching? Well, I've been watching The Umbrella Academy Season 3. Ooh. Is it good? I've really enjoyed it. There's a lot of time travel shenanigans. Uh, more than what you'd expect from a... I think it's a kind of program that is essentially a pastiche of the superhero genre. And you think it would go down that direction, but they've essentially failed to stop the apocalypse from happening three times now. <laughs> And it also strikes me that they were directly responsible for the first two and indirectly responsible for the third. So it's it's sort of your Tony Stark scenario where you have or Mission Impossible, the Impossible Mission Force, the IMF Bureau, I think they're called, where an organization is created to stop something, they actually create far more problems than they <laughs> solve. And obviously, I mean that with Tony Stark, I think the majority of his villains were homegrown. Yeah, yeah, where he's like, he pissed this guy off, or like, he built this machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he has a lot of disgruntled employees that are coming back to bite him in the ass. And with, obviously, the Mission Impossible series, I think it's the fourth film, Ghost Protocol, where they actually fight an outside threat for the first time. The <laughs> first three films, they're house cleaning. You know, it's a bit like the opposite of The Fast and the Furious, right? You know, I have a family, they <laughs> use this system of... If you try and kill us, you can join us. <laughs> yeah, they've got the weirdest recruitment strategy ever. Um, with the Umbrella Academy, it's essentially it was um, it's seven heroes that were famous when they were at school in the Umbrella Academy, and they've then grown up. They come back together, but they've they've all gone their different ways, and most of them have left the hero work behind. One character I want to highlight actually that stand out to me is uh, Klaus who I think was number four. Mm. Oh, yeah, the father numbered them, by the way, as opposed to giving them actual names. And Klaus is a very much a sort of hedonistic love of joie de vivre, joy's life, um, I think multi-sexual type individual. His power revolves around um, communicating with and summoning the dead, which he hates. To. He, he's a fantastic character because... He is so ill-suited to the powers that he has. And that's not something I'd say I've encountered much in the superhero world, where someone has powers, and not only do they not want them, they're completely ill-suited for it. Klaus is all about life. His powers are all about death. I seen season one. I really liked him in that. Um, the same actor was in uh, Misfits, I believe he mm-hmm. played uh, Nathan in Misfits, and he, you know, he was a standout in that show as well. Yeah. Even over the dude who played Ramsay Bolton in Game of Thrones, who began in Misfits. With Umbrella Academy, I like that kid who's like a 50-year-old man in a yeah. child's body. He's fantastic. He's the actor. I think he's 18 years old now, and he was 15 when he started it. And his power is quite good. He can teleport from place to place in the blink of an eye. And I do enjoy the way that, even though you've got a child actor portraying a man in his 50s, all the rest of their cast are sort of in their early 30s, say. He's, you've, got a, you've positioned a young actor in a way that he has to talk down to all these adults that are older than him. <laughs> and it, but it does make for some fantastic viewing in those scenes with uh, number five. And he has, I think he's the only one that never actually picked a name. He's just, they just call him number five. Uh, Jim, have you watched Umbrella Academy at all? Yeah, I in fact enjoyed season three that much. I watched it all in the same day. I just yeah. couldn't, I, I couldn't leave it at that. I had to, you know, each episode, yeah, I'll watch another, just see how it goes. And before I knew it, I was done with it. But yeah, everything Alistair said about it, it's, it rings true. It's fantastic. And Robert Sheehan is definitely the 
the yeah. absolute star of that show. And yeah, everyone's great in it, but he just shines brighter than everyone else. Uh, yeah, yeah. You often got the usual sort of think of the character Luther is your sort of you know quote unquote the straight guy. He's just strong. He's like Mister Incredible, if you will, from that franchise. But in this season, I was really really happy about the romance story that he had with. Hmm. I'll go too much into spoilers, but I'll say from the Raven Academy, no, the Sparrow Academy. Sparrows. Sparrows, that's right. Uh, he, he he hooks up with one of them, and even though they're all, all seven of them are biologically, they're not related, they did grow up together as a family. And season one and two hint at will they, won't they, between Luther, who's number one, and Alison, who's number three. And b- because they're brother and sister, it's a bit weird. <laughs> and this season three luther gets a definitive romance outside of allison i was just so happy we're putting the weirdness behind us now over the moon with us so that um it, it took out something that i wasn't a huge fan of in seasons one and two and i think it just makes for season three just a little bit better this time i think i think uh, one thing I really liked about the first season was the soundtrack that you got. You know, you've mm-hmm. got your kind of bubblegum pop songs and stuff coming in, or like, you know, um, We Might Be Giants, that sort of thing coming in too. I wish I assume they're still sticking with that kind of aesthetic for Yeah, it, right? there's um, one of the opening... <laughs> it starts off with a dance-off, season <laughs> three. That's so it's right at the beginning. And Sparrow Academy and um, Umbrella Academy enter into a, a little bit of a dance-off you think it's going to build up to a fight and it is it is a great laugh out loud visual gag when the leader of the sparrows just starts bopping a beat and they have the dance-off and it's footloose <laughs> and throughout the series what i've noticed is that it's set in 1999 because the first season aired in 1999 and even though it's three seasons we're into three season three now chronologically within the universe only 20 days have actually transpired so bearing in mind these characters have managed to blow up the planet three times in that space of time <laughs> and in that sequence what i've noticed throughout the show is even though it's set obviously 999 but the, the technology of what they're using is, is very antiquated they have tapes they have walkman when they use a phone it's your old dial tone cable no none of them have cell phones yeah i mean i think the the lack of cell phones must be quite liberating from the writer's perspective mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. incidentally i take it you guys know who the writer of umbrella academy is are we talking the tv show or the comic books uh, both i believe it's uh it's jared wave the singer of my chemical romance <laughs> is the guy who uh yeah. did it now mcr i believe are back to being a band now as well um not a fan yeah. but you know it's it was interesting that he's had such a successful career reinvention you know going from one kind of medium into another and like you can still have like quite independent fan base there you know you've got your umbrella academy fans who don't necessarily give a shit about mcr mm-hmm. and i imagine your average mcr well there's probably more mcr fans like the umbrella academy than the other way around but uh yeah i think that's quite i think that's quite cool uh anything else you want to, you want to talk about before we move on to jim I think the Umbrella Academy covers it quite nicely. It's uh, I like the way that uh, Netflix release a TV show that you can just you can binge it. Mm. Um, even though I think this is one of the shows that uh, I know that if it had been released weekly, I'd be chomping at the bit to see the next episode. It is one of those shows can very easily cane the whole three all in one day. I think just like uh, Jim has. I guess it's a double-edged sword, that, though, because... Uh, so Better Call Saul's going to be returning uh, this, this coming month. I really like having that week between episodes because mm. I know that I, I just sit down and indulge and watch all six of them or something and then go, oh, I want more. You know, mm. I, I, I quite I quite like the um, uh, having that sort of time to digest between episodes or discuss theories and stuff like that. So I sort of worry that nowadays it's so easy to consume an entire series that, uh, you know, you're sort of like... It feels less special when you find one that you like. That's my personal take well, on it. We say that it, it, in a way that if, let's say, we're watching a TV show and we only have the one episode to chat about on a weekly basis, then we're left to really go into the nuance of that episode, what this could mean, what that could mean. And the conversation, I suppose, if a TV show is released all at once, kablam, then the conversation is then reduced to talking about the broad strokes of the series as a whole. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I suppose it depends on the sort of show, though, right? Because like, something like The Sopranos, um, I absolutely love The Sopranos. I don't think it mm-hmm. lends itself to binge-watching, though. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I guess I could imagine sort of binge-watching, like, a, a comedy show quite a lot of the time, for example. You know, I don't think you'd have the same, oh, the peep show's on, you know, I best watch one episode of this or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you do have that with 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 some other shows, with sort of more dramatic things, like Succession's another one. I love Succession. I couldn't binge Succession. Uh, Jim, what have you been watching lately? I was sticking with Netflix and binge watching. I watched the rest of Stranger Things season four at the weekend as that launched Friday, I believe it was. Uh, very good. I'm not going to go into it too much because uh, I think we spoke about this last time as well, but it was a great conclusion to what I think is probably the best series of the lot so far. Um, some cracking moments and... There was one particular bit, I'm sure you've read about it online by now, which involves Metallica's Master of Puppets, and it just got me so hyped. And just as it got going, my Netflix stopped. And (laughs) I thought I had a power cut for a moment. But uh, yeah, I have no idea why that happened, but got so hyped and then nothing. The screen just went black. I thought, oh, is this this part of the act? Or, you know, but no, it's just kind of took me out of that moment but other than that yeah cracking series also i have watched the batman finally it's one i'd put off for a little while because just well solely down to the running time really i mean batman is probably my favorite superhero but after so many years of just kind of same retread i mean Zack snyder pretty much rebooted it and we went through all the parents getting killed thing again and yeah i think in the we've seen we've seen martha and thomas wayne die like four times now. yeah <laughs> so all that and plus i find with a lot of the older batman films even though i really like the chris nolan ones mm-hmm. they there's far too much self-importance with them. but yeah, i i, I found with the newer way. one that it didn't kind of have that yeah it was serious but it didn't feel as self-important as the previous Batman films we've had in like the last 10 or so years. And that was refreshing for a start. And it was just a decent story. I enjoyed the Riddler as a villain and uh, the the way all that unraveled and when they finally, conf- well, when Batman finally confronts him at the end, that was a pretty neat part as well. Uh, again, not wanting to spoil it because it's fairly new. Um, just, yeah, I had a good time with it. And you did not feel that running time, I thought. I mean, that was one of the big mm. things that put me off it. But having finally seen it, yeah, it's pretty good. And speaking uh, of films with... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, on that one, I was totally going to back you up on just about every point there. I think Riddler was fantastic. I think it was the best representation of Gotham that we've ever had. Mm. Like, with, with the Nolan ones, I really like them. They just look like New York City. You know, yeah. and um, there you just kind of got a real feel for what this city would be. It just felt so immersive. So, yeah, you're totally right. I thought the plot was a bit annoyingly convoluted, though, because, you know, we know that all roads will lead to the Riddler at some point. Hmm. And then they yeah. got this bit at the beginning where they're like, opening 20 minutes, here's the entire cast, right? You get you meet them very briefly. And then, like, two hours later, they're still referring back to that opening scene as if you know who any of these people are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do find that a bit condescending when films do that sometimes, especially like when they flash back to something that happened five minutes ago. But, you know, it's a few little niggles here and there. I mean, it's not a perfect film by any means. I'd say it's a four star movie myself, but really enjoyable, a really good Batman film. Um, another really enjoyable film, probably the best film I've seen this year, is RRR. Uh, yeah. It's uh, an Indian film that is currently on Netflix. and I guess the best description of it would be an action epic where we see the rise of the resistance against the British colonization in India in the 20s, full of some of the best, most ridiculous action and stunts you've ever seen, and one of the best dance-offs you'll ever see in a film as well. it's about three hours long as well, and normally that would put me off, but from the get-go with this, I was hooked and just could not stop watching till the end. And even the ending was just pure, ridiculous action fun. And 
It's probably the most uncynical action movie I've ever seen as well. Everything is so sincere, the friendships on the film, the action, the motivations. They even have their own awesome little theme tunes throughout the film as well. And I was just so hyped watching it all the way through. Just every little thing that happened, just doing little air punches. It's just ridiculous. And you, you really need to see it. It puts Hollywood to shame. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've not watched it myself yet, but like Twitter has absolutely gone crazy about this film. You know, everyone fucking loves it. Everyone swears <laughs> by it. it. Yeah, it sounds impressive. Yeah, I mean, uh, from what I've seen so far this year, that's definitely top of the list. Not too far off the top, though, would be uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. A- another action spectacular, although I do feel the awesome beginning and end is really weighed down by a really, really saggy middle. Oh, That's... you reckon? I thought the middle <laughs> yeah. was all right. I've... Maybe it gets slightly too goofy at points of the middle, but I, was, like, <laughs> I, I just couldn't get on board with the bagel part, for instance. Mm. Uh, if anyone has not seen this film, I there's a... It's a plot point involving a bagel, my friend, and it's uh, and that's one of the things they just never quite sold to me, sold this to me. I assume we're trying to do something symbolic with it. And little bits like that just yes. the character motivations, but I loved it, man. But I all the way like all the way through the film, I I was just I was I just I just felt very immersed in it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I came away like just absolutely buzzing after the end of it, but I did feel about um, halfway through that I was like, yeah, can we? get on with it a bit <laughs> but like the the performances in it the action uh, the characters all fantastic uh, and i think it's probably one of the best performances i've seen from jamie lee curtis in maybe oh, anything God, she was so funny in it i <laughs> i did i did not expect her to be uh, michelle yale was ace mm. oh, incredible and it's, it's extremely relatable i mean, i don't want to get too much into the subtext about the revelations and stuff at the end, but a lot of the family drama was very... I could empathise with. <laughs> I've also... You've got the kid who plays short round as back as the yeah. uh, husband. <laughs> yeah, I've <laughs> sat for a couple brilliant. of minutes. I, I know you. And funnily enough, he's still got the same voice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's the, the best film about a multiverse that's come out this year. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no doubt about it. <laughs> Um, there seem to be a few multiverse films at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was probably the most welcome one, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, also, uh, I know my list is getting longer, but I finally managed to watch Legion, the Exorcist Free Director's Cut. Uh, now, it turns out it's just made up of a lot of footage that was used as alternatives to the footage that was lost. So, uh, alternative angles and dailies, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, a lot of the footage cut in it was uh, from VHS tapes and didn't have a score or anything like that. So, I think some of it's not quite seamless and it does seem a bit jarring at times. Although essentially it is the same story, only maybe a bit more of focused on Brad Doris' performance. Now, there's a lot more of him monologuing and just being generally intimidating. But overall, not quite as good as the theatrical cut, which makes a change in these instances, which, yeah, I love Exorcist Free, one of my favourite horror films. Legion cut, good as like a curiosity or, you know, just... It's one of those things that's been banded about the internet for years, and I finally got to see it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was quite like that entry in the uh, Exorcist franchise. Certainly, a mark up for Exorcist Two, the Heretic. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like um, it's a bit, a bit like Cycle Two, where uh, because the f- the first one is so damn good, mm. it, almost like you, you know, like the third Exorcist film would be the best in the franchise without the first one, obviously. Um, yeah. It's far better than the other four. Um, there's four others, isn't there? Uh, yeah, you've got well, the two. Dominion, there's a few, quite well, a few yeah, prequels. Yeah, you've got three, yeah. three, three others, actually, yeah. It's definitely, the, it's definitely the, 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 the best of the sequels, but it just doesn't seem that special because it's following something that's so fucking good. You know, and I, mm-hmm. I said Cycle 2 is the same. I think it's by far the best of the uh, three Cycle sequel, uh, sequels. Um, it's just... Because it's a sequel to the Alfred Hitchcock one, you know. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's certainly a lot going for it. Uh, Exorcist Three, 
and it, it follows on, I think, correctly from how you should have followed on from The Exorcist in a way that Exorcist 2 just didn't. Hmm. Uh, have you got any other what last ones you want to mention, Jim? Uh, I've seen Jurassic World Dominion recently, um, hmm. but that didn't particularly thrill me all that much. In a film series about dinosaurs and this finale in particular we've got to a point where dinosaurs have actually got out in the world they're taking over so let's do a film about genetically modified locusts instead oh fuck yeah <laughs> it was ridiculous like a company to go we're going to make some super locusts that will eat crops made by other other food companies and nobody will notice this apparently <laughs> That, that's a completely different film. That that shouldn't have been. No. Finale, I should say. I'll give this for like I personally enjoyed it roughly as much as the other two Jurassic Worlds, which uh, and I enjoy all three of them more than the second and third Jurassic Park. Obviously, the first Jurassic Park is mm-hmm. a completely different league from anything else in that franchise. But I think the good thing about this one is I expected Ellie Sattler and Alan Grant to be cameos. I was really pleasantly surprised that they get they definitely get more than half the film. Yeah, th- I mean, they did have that going for it, and it wasn't as self-referential as I was expecting as well. I mean, there was mm. the odd bit here and there, you know, a call back to the first film and so on, but yeah, it, it, it was definitely a lot more restrained than I was expecting when it came to using the characters from the original film. Although I must say, Vince Vaughn has been done an injustice. Uh, where was he? <laughs> <laughs> he was playing the character Nick Van Dyne from uh, The Lost World, Jurassic Park 2. <laughs> I think with uh, what's his face, Jeff Goldblum, I think he got a lot of really good, clearly improvised bits from him. He was he uh, he really gave a lot of the comic relief. I liked when he, the bit where he's just looking at the camera and goes Jurassic World. Not a fan. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think the worst thing about these films is being Chris Pratt from the beginning. Uh, like, mm. it's not even that he's a bad actor. Um, it's just his character is too good. You know, we never yeah. buy that he's... Like, it's a bit like yeah. to, uh, Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible films. We never really buy that he's in much danger. It's just he's also less likable than Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible films. Uh, with Tom Cruise, there's this bizarre kind of energy that he's able to bring to uh, to anything. You know, whether you're mm-hmm. watching, like, uh, Top Gun or something like Magnolia, you know, there's an intensity about his performance that it's, it's almost quite, quite addictive. And Chris Pratt just doesn't have that presence. It's also no. not helped that him and uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, I genuinely can't think of two romantic leads that seem to like each other less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're just bound together with mutual indifference. Yeah, like you never buy that there's any particular warmth between them here. I mean, maybe it's bad writing. I think the acting, there's just not, there just isn't a chemistry there. I have to say, one other thing I picked up on watching that was it was edited really, really badly. Like, they wanted to just skip out on someone walking a couple of steps so they would suddenly cut to them being the other side of a room or nearer someone. <laughs> it was like it was edited by someone who makes TikToks for a living. <laughs> it was just really badly done. That or would it be someone really that uh, plays uh, Skyrim and they want to fast travel? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, literally, it, it did skip a mm-hmm. few steps just just for the sake of it and it just was so disjointed and jarring it really aggravated me at times and uh, one that i believe we disagree on is uh, you watched the uh, the black phone <laughs> didn't you yeah 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 really good that um i was i've been looking forward to that for a long time i mean it oh, must have been some reason what you thought was shit <laughs> No, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, 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 really yeah, it. yeah, it's great. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember seeing the trailer for it. It must have been when I went to see The Invisible Man, you know, like just before the, like, the lockdowns and COVID and everything. And because I, I remember taking uh, my daughter, and, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and we were both like, oh, that black phone looks great. And then it just kept getting delayed and delayed. And yeah, finally got to see it. So, you know, there was a bit of hype from my point of view, especially after seeing Sinister recently as well for the first time. <laughs> so again, you know, I'm pretty hyped for that, but it doesn't quite hit the heights of Sinister, but it was still a really enjoyable, kind of Stephen King style you know, horror. It was really mm-hmm. good. Yeah, well, it's me, it's Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, uh, mm. his source material. And 
The short story it's based on is not a particularly remarkable short story. I say that as a Joe Hill fan, by the way. Uh, Nosferatu, which is spelt like a card number plate, which is why I tried to say it like a card number plate. That's well worth a read. But my favourite thing about this film was I thought the two kids were phenomenal. I thought, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I totally bought their relationship as brother and sister, you know, and it gave a lot of depth to... Uh, to the movie, like if I'm a, like I didn't like the the way the two plot strands they had, you know, her investigation mm. and him being captured. Without going into spoilers, I didn't really like the way that they connected by the end. I I, I thought I thought one of those two strands was done a disservice. Uh, yeah. I which. There was a certain element to the finale as well that felt to me very much like a point and click PC game. It's <laughs> just a lot of. Mm. of choose puzzles where you've got oh, to do yeah. this to affect this and I thought when it all came together I just couldn't help but think of maybe it's like a video game puzzle and <laughs> as fun as it was it just did seem a bit far out you know? yeah uh, but yeah they're, they're very 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 good movie and also I really appreciated the use of Pink Floyd's uh, On the Run during the finale sequence as soon as that started I was like oh, fuck yes it's a great little needle drop so uh, <laughs> That also pleased me. Uh, I'm going to go through my wee list. This has taken us ages to get to the uh, Blair Witch meet here. It's not because well, I assume none of us hated all three of them or anything along those lines. <laughs> I will come to my prediction on what I think uh, Jim's going to have thought of the Blair Witch films very soon. But firstly, so uh, Jurassic World, we already talked about that. Uh, if I watched Tax Driver for the first time recently. Now, I'd put off watching this for the longest time, but I absolutely loved it. It was way less violent than I thought it was going to be. Instead, it was actually just really sad for a lot of it. Like, it's a really good character study. And what's interesting is while you sympathise with um, Travis Bickle, it never disguises that he's a horrible person as well. You know, it doesn't disguise the kind of darkness that's at his core. And... Robert De Niro just does such a good job of playing up with the character's loneliness, his alienation. I just thought it was a remarkable performance. You know, it's almost saying Robert De Niro does a good job. It's, it's, <laughs> it's it, it, you know, it's almost almost not even worth pointing that out. But what I really got from him is like, as an actor, there's no Robert De Niro there. There's just the character. You know, you, it's not like when you're watching Jack Nicholson or Tom Hanks, where there's a persona behind the character they're playing. With De Niro, you just see the character. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, how many times has it been discussed, written about, all sorts? Uh, he, he's just mesmerising, isn't he? You, you can't take your eyes off. He's just one of those actors that keeps your attention, uh, well, in his heyday. <laughs> Yeah, uh. <laughs> I, I mean, it's interesting with uh, him and Martin Scorsese, you know, they've ended um, a King of Comedy. Now, King of Comedy, it's very similar thematically, but such a different style of movie. I think, actually, if you kind of combine King of Comedy and uh, Taxi Driver, you end up with something that resembles the recent Joker film, which actually made me like the uh, Joker less after watching <laughs> Taxi Driver. <laughs> Next one, so... Midnight Cowboy, also really sad. Watched it for the first time recently. Really good soundtrack, excellent acting, and just a really good atmosphere. You know, a lot like um, like Taxi Driver, you're really kind of seeing the people on the fringes of society throughout this. You're getting a really good street-level view, and uh, yeah, really worth, uh, really worth watching. Now, I did watch something that wasn't sad, although actually it does have a bit of sadness to it. Planes, trains, and automobiles. This is the first right, time baby. I'd ever seen this. It is so funny. Like, I've, I, I, I don't know, like, uh, I did, I've not really seen much John Candy except for uh, Uncle Buck and yeah. Home Alone. Yeah. You know, I, don't, I, don't really, I, don't, I don't really know John Candy from his heyday, but, um, but yeah, I, I thought this film was absolutely hilarious. You know, laughed my ass off all the way through it. And, like, the serious bits just sneak up on you. You've got so much Ooh. goodwill for these characters. And it's such a good pairing, you know, that, yeah, it is an odd couple that we're getting. We're getting the, like, the kind of carefree Joker, I and mean, you've got the guy with the stick up his butt, right? But at the same time, they both kind of go beyond stereotype. They both take to the roles of nuance. They've got fantastic chemistry together, you know. Uh, yeah. may not be romantic, but Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard can learn a lot from that. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, ab- absolutely ace. Because I-, I watched that because I was after Midnight Cowboy. I wanted to watch a I wanted to watch another road movie basically, and that was just making all the list of the best road movies. I was like, really? And uh, yeah, I can see why. Absolutely brilliant. I just want to chip in and say that I thought the Steve Martin films. I think that is one of my favourites. I've always enjoyed planes, trains, and automobiles. It's almost a go-to movie. If you want a little pick me up, just want to give you a bit of detail about some of the background and one of those scenes in that film where it fo- the camera focuses on Steve Martin and he's reflecting on the time that he's had with John Candy, sort of laughing and having these thoughts, his face changes. Apparently that, that wasn't actually scripted. The camera was just rolling and he was thinking about all the fun he'd had working with John Candy in real life. They thought, that's actually really good. Could we use that in the film? For the oh, flashback oh, montage of you and Joe <laughs> Candy together, and Steve Martin was all for it. I just, I just love that detail. Without going into spoiler territory, I mean, I know it's an old film, but you know, some people, some people have never seen it mm. before, um, including me until last week. And without going to spoil, spoil territory, it's worth googling to see what the alternative ending for the film was, because the ending we got wasn't quite what was meant to happen. It was a much oh. darker ending that they originally had, and uh, it just went down like a lead balloon, so using the footage of the hat that they had left, he managed to just kind of make what we see. But, mm. yeah, I, th- I thought it was, was phenomenal. Um, I did see another horror film, by the way. The uh, horror film that I watched was uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Now, Killing of a Sacred Deer is initially really hard to get into because of the intentionally dulled acting. So... Like, when I was watching this, seeing, uh, what's his face, Col- uh, Colin Farrell, and he's kind of doing this really monotone voice, I was like, what the fuck's going on? Has he forgotten how to act or something? Like, how was the director okay with this? But then as it goes on, like, you kind of just get the vibe. Like, they, the characters live in a world where fate exists. And that's not a spoiler, it comes up very early on. And it's about what that would do to people, how that would change the way that you mm. respond to others emotionally, how you, your sort of sense of uh, your own future. and um, it has a really neat little premise that uh, once you find out what's going on about, say, uh, about a third or maybe, yeah, about a third of the way through the movie, you then go, oh, I get what this relationship's all about here. And from there, it just gets this really dark kind of humour comes into it. There's a really interesting moral conundrum at its core. You really can't see where this one's going. I absolutely loved it. So, Killing the Sacred Deer, well worth watching. Uh, there's one other thing I think we all got to briefly tackle before we get to Blair Witch, which we, we will, and that's Kenobi is ended. Now, I thought Kenobi was genuinely fine. Like, you know, I, I, I don't really like the idea of we're getting a direct, sequ- uh, direct prequel, sorry, to episode four, 45 years later, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, the f- you know, for what it is, I quite enjoyed it. I think with uh, the finale, they did a good job of generating tension, despite that we know that t- the two leads are going to survive it. Because we go, well, they can't kill... Um, we, they, well, the three leads, they can't kill Leia, they can't kill uh, Obi-Wan, and they can't kill Vader, right? But they still managed to infuse it with enough, uh, enough kind of dramatics that I think it, I think it worked. Yeah, I mean, that final confrontation between the two was brilliant. Vader throughout the series has been very, very unnerving, more than he ever has done in the films. Mm. And I think I just really enjoyed seeing Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan again. I'm probably one of the six people who actually enjoy the prequel trilogy. Obviously, (laughs) Attack of the Clones is in its own little garbage world, but the other two films, I think, are fantastic. But yeah, it was. I know it's not gone down too great with wider audiences, but I had a really good time with it. Hey, Alistair, were you a fan? I was. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, it's not the perfect show, and uh, it is another prequel. And the fact that it's a prequel is means it's a sort of the void of tension that uh, you know when certain characters can't be harmed and beyond a certain way because they have they have to turn up in a certain position in the future so there's an element of you know it can't go that way you know there's a there's a safety net under this form of entertainment so to speak and it's always a pleasure to see uh ewan mcgregor as obi-wan and i quite enjoyed seeing the darth vader scenes especially when he had lost a section of 
mask and he was uh, talking in both mm. the voices uh, from the machine and the man a uh, good merging that i really i really liked that I, I heard it was meant to be a two and a half hour film as opposed to a uh, mini series and to be honest i think it could have worked really well as a two and a half hour film as well um but i believe it was solo bombing that made him cancel that i think what we're seeing with disney is this sort of attempt to say well we're going to build up an archive here because whilst we're spunking a lot of money on shows like this and you'll give it like 10 years if someone's coming to disney plus or whatever the version of disney plus is 10 years from now they are going to have like you know here's 11 movies that you can watch if you want to watch star wars if they'll probably have well we'll probably be more movies in 10 years time we'll be like here's 15 movies and here's like six different shows and things so i i assume it's about building up that brand you know building up that uh that collection you know same thing we've got with marvel where if you want to watch a marvel uh thing and you go well we've got 30 movies on here and we've got like uh nine or ten shows however many there are now and uh you know whilst as for coming out individually they're not exactly wonderful and a lot of the time you get a bit of re- release fatigue i think a decade from now it'll be really cool just having access to all of them in one place i think that's what we're doing it does mean that for using quantity over quality quite often mm. but at the same yes. time um well yeah they, they, they do have a streaming platform to fill up i i, and I assume that like this is about the long-term plan basically anyway speaking of long-term plans we plan to speak about the blair witch films so why don't we let's talk firstly about blair witch project no we're not locked it's all over the place but how do we know it was people well even if it wasn't i'm not gonna play with that either and it's not because of me that we're here now. <laughs> Hungry and cold and hunted. I just want to apologize to Mike's mom and Josh's mom and my mom. Tell me where you are, John! The Player Witch Project. So, this came out in 1999. I saw this underage at the tender age of 13 in the cameo cinema in edinburgh so a uh, cameo cinema if you're listening to this <laughs> um, now i thought this was absolutely terrifying at the time uh, the whole last sequence in the house scared the absolute shite out of me now at that age this was before the internet was really a big thing some of the younger listeners may not believe that um you know we that was back when the internet was something that you would have to like you, you could use it and use the, t- the house phone at the same time. <laughs> it was a totally different era. Um, so I, I, I bought the hype. I thought it was real, you know. And um, I, I guess uh, you never the movie The Fourth Kind that came out a few years ago. One of uh, Milia Jovovich. Say a few years ago. That's like. Two, two I'm seasons. aware of it. Yeah, it's uh, mm-hmm. probably yeah, so, about twenty years now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was. It was a bit shit, right? But at the same time, with The Fourth Kind, something I thought was relatively interesting was they did the split screen bit we're going here's the real footage on the left and what you're watching is the dramatization now both of them were obviously fake but at the same time if that come out in 1999 when like blair witch did when you didn't have like wikipedia you didn't have like uh, an online press kind of digging into what was going on in this maybe it could have caught the public imagination in the same way Anyway, that's that's my thought for the day. Um, Possible, I think, with that, just to uh, sort of punctuate that thought you're having right there, um, one of the things I am going to say about uh, the Blair Witch Project is outside of the movie itself, it was an absolute masterpiece of marketing. Mm. And it, it, it happened at the right time because the internet was awash with uh, the conspiracy theories that, well, the internet is still filled with conspiracy theories, but <laughs> you didn't have the legit websites to counteract the marketing. So there wasn't any Wikipedia, there wasn't any IMDb. There was none of that where you could go and approach and see what the actual details of this movie production was. And I think that essentially aided and abetted the people buying into what they were trying to sell with this movie, that this what you're seeing is real. Yeah, because with that one, you had three kind of no-name actors that were appearing in it. You know, none of them have had careers since, really, either. But you got three kind of no-name actors. Mm-hmm. So uh, they built up, you know, that website, the uh, Missing People one they built up, and uh, also 
Jim, did you watch the Curse of the Blair Witch documentary? Yeah. Yeah, because I thought that was a really interesting bit of marketing there, because something they were able to do really well with the documentary was fill in some of the blanks from the movie itself, because quite a few of this, this plot points we get are quite decontextualized. You know, we don't really know a whole lot about uh, Russ and Parr. We hear about the little girl being abducted, but it's all done very quickly, you know, very efficiently. And uh, in this, it just kind of fleshes out the lore. I think it was really good as a tie-in. Hmm. Yeah, it, it worked nicely um, as a bit of background story to everyone and everything in it, really. Um, it was a good accompaniment. Aye, mm -hmm. and we get again. The thing is, we get like uh, we get to see some of the relationships develop. You know, we've got Josh's girlfriend in it. You know, we we don't know what uh, from the movie. Obviously, what other people's reactions are going to be like. You know, we know that uh, Josh mentions his girlfriend being worried about him, but at the same time, we, we it really adds something to see that she misses him. You know, it's uh, when we also get the sheriff, Sheriff Cravens, is notably not the same Sheriff Cravens from the second one. <laughs> You know, I think it just adds to the world building quite a lot, and you get you know you get more history of Burkittsville and stuff like that. I just thought it was a really fantastic little documentary. Which I mean, even in the beginning of the actual film, you've got that great exposition dump of the documentary footage that they filmed, all the interviews with residents and so on, and mm. that does an absolutely spot on job of filling in the lore and everything we need to know about the Blair Witch up to that point. Anyway, so yeah. that extra uh, special feature documentary whatever that just that's kind of the icing on the cake to the whole experience i think in terms of i think world building say there's like you need to put in what's relevant to the story but often i suppose a writer a creator will at some length create more of the world that won't make it into the story but the reader or the viewer will need to believe that the creator knows what the universe is it's through through and through and what the documentary shows is that they, they really did have it all identified and all laid out and they knew exactly what the story what the power is what everything is behind the the eponymous villain the blair witch and yeah because we also got things like the stick figures i don't think the movie actually tells us about the stick figures at all does it you know, they use it as, like, mm -hmm. it's there as iconography. And, by the way, great iconography in these <laughs> films. Stick figures, the rocks. It's, 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 things like that are just immediately immediately identifiable. It's so minimalistic as well, but very effectively uh, applied in the film. I And I think with the uh, documentary, I think that aired on TV on the, on the lead-up to the movie coming out. Mm. which I enjoyed that at the end it it, uh, it brings into question the authenticity of the movie itself to kind of go oh we're sowing some seeds of doubt here and also that you see where the footage was found because that thing comes back in Blair Witch Project mm. 2 but we'll get to Blair Witch yeah. Project 2 soon so yeah basically uh, if anyone's got the DVD or Blu-ray then uh, make sure you watch The Curse of Blair Witch Project. I thought The Curse of Blair Witch was ace. Oh, and also, how much fun must they have had, had of designing all the old documents, like all the old drawings and things? That was so cool. I didn't know Burkittsville was a real place until very recently. It was uh, uh, Jeff Shepard, the uh, writer on uh, Dashcam and Toast, uh, he was recently visiting Burkittsville. It's why everyone assumes he'll be directing the fourth one. And... Um, uh, yeah, he was showing photographs of the cemetery and stuff like that. I just, I, just, I had no idea if he used a real place, so that was cool. Um, anyway, let's talk about Blair Witch Project. So, what are your overall thoughts on this movie, guys? So let's start with yourself, Alistair. What do you think of Blair Witch Project? Really enjoyed it. As a minimalist project, a, a film, no CGI, pleasantly for a horror film, no jump scares. It built up mood, atmosphere, suspense. I suppose a sense of dread. Um, there's so many of what this film does. You can see it being reused again and again in other found footage films. Like we're talking, say, Grave Encounters, for instance, Paranormal Activity. There's, I mean, I think the entire, essentially the found footage front, sorry, genre of movie owes a lot to the Blair Witch Project. Now, I know it's not the first uh, found footage, but it's certainly the found footage film that, like, exploded in a way that so few films ever do. It's, it's, the, it's become famous to the point of, you know, people 
that have never even seen the film will still know about it decades after the film was in cinemas. And, it's basically yeah. the doom of the found footage genre, isn't yes. it? It's the benchmark people yeah. have to measure everything that's come since. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got... I mean, there's a few things I would say that work to its favour as well. So you got, obviously, the interviews at the very beginning, and one of them talks about how you got a man... Stand, or or the, the children would stand in the corner and look away. And that's what comes up at the end. But th- usually you'd get a, a routine, say, the setup. It's not just setup and payoff. It, depending on the time between the two, you'd get a setup, reminder, and then payoff. And there's no reminder for the standing in the corner. So I do believe one critique of the film was that a lot of people were confused by the ending. But actually, I kind of like the film more for that because it, it lends itself to re-watching, a re viewing the film when you go back to the beginning and you'll immediately know what that's all about when the interviewer says that yeah totally agreed it doesn't hand it to you in a plate and mm-hmm. if i'd ask you that probably asked of your authenticity as well because you don't yeah. have the sort of signpost of hey remember this i think um i i was pleasantly surprised by how well it still watches you know if it, like, there's some films that i guess come to define an era uh that when you you know, when you're watching them again later, they just kind of feel a bit caught in that era. Like, as much as I enjoy the first Matrix or something like that, it's um, it's difficult to fully appreciate that in 2022. Whereas I would say with the Blair Witch Project, um, you know, it still watches to me, it still watches as well as it ever mm-hmm. has done. You know, it's... Um, yeah, it's been influential. Yeah, there's a lot of films that have done things that it did, and some of them have probably, some of them are probably better than it. Like I'd say, Wreck is a, it's a better fine footage film, for example. But I think what we have here that I don't think I've seen paralleled by any other fine footage is just this slow building sense of dread. You know, as you used the word minimalism earlier, and this is very minimalist. You know, we don't see like anything during this movie. Yeah. Yeah. So much of it comes down to the, the sound design, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. or, or like implications. Like a really small scene that I love is, you know, the beginning when we see the fishermen, right? The fishermen are telling their stories. And it was just something about like stopping off by the river and seeing them that sells that they're, you know, they're, they're getting further away from the safety of Burkittsville here. You know, they're yeah. getting deeper into the woods. You know, this, this is basically as far as the locals will go, that sort of vibe. And, uh, yeah, you know, once we're in the woods itself, you know, they are they're just a set of woods, but fuck, you know, they build so much, so much atmosphere, such good locations there. I I think it's still really, really good. I suppose there's a... They get paranoid in a way that you see rarely happen in films. Like, another one that comes to mind is uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. And... It it really builds up. I think we should need to talk about the cast as well. So we've got Joshua, I believe it was Michael and Heather, are the three film crew that head into the woods and as part of their film project. So Heather's the one I think wants to be there. The other two, not so much. Mm. And it's a great source of tension. And when you just sell a story is these aren't actors playing a role. These are real people. It, it really works. There, it, that sort of naturalistic, unscripted dialogue that they were uh, told to use comes across really well. It's it's not just the main cast either. It's literally everyone in the film, the people they're interviewed. It'd be convinced that these were just mm. the residents of that village. You've got you know a couple of the old people, you know, been there all their lives, can recount these stories. They, they re- do it so convincingly, and then you've got that woman with her kid, yeah. uh, and the kid's like trying to put her hand over her mouth to tell her to stop talking about the you know the scary witch and stuff. Like just all those little, all those little bits. It's just those bit parts. Every single person in the film absolutely sells it. Can I just say as a little note that I'd put down about when they're interviewing the woman who's carrying the child? Because remember that the, the Blair Witch was a killer of children. <laughs> and the child's going no and like stopping her mother talking about it. I, just, I quite like that I detail. Never, I never picked up on that. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I think I could, I could be misremembering this, but 
I believe that the cast were given an outline for what would happen in the scenes, or they'd be told there was some we were going to start making noises, but they wouldn't know what the noises are. But I think it's a bit like Kirby Enthusiasm, where they're working to bullet points, but they don't have a script in the traditional sense. And I think it was just a case of, like, you know, get to know your characters, make shit up with each other, and, you know, as long as this information's included, and uh, if we're just going to, like, shake a bush or something along those lines. So... Uh, which basically sounds like, a, sounds like a horrible filming experience. So, yeah, the authenticity is so important to this. Yeah, they do sell at these uh, unknown actors. Uh, standout scenes for me are when, and this will become another, this ends up being a trope. I don't think it's a trope if you see it the very first time in a found footage film, but they go walking in a direction away from uh, the log over a river. And then they keep going south for the entire day and walk right back up to where they started. And Heather has a veritable breakdown when she's seeing that. She goes through the process of denying that it's not the same log, it's not the same log. And then she's eventually... It, mm. it, it's a psychological... Like, these characters get torn down over the course of this. And there's a point when there's... I think it's Michael and... Uh, Heather have a conversation about well, which way do we go now? We went south all day, we ended up back where we left and they talk about the Wizard of Oz and how we got, which one was the bad way? <laughs> the one from the west? Okay, we'll go east. Like they, they've been <laughs> demolished, they're, they're hopeless to such a point where you, you are at the point of just flip a coin, what do we do now? Mm. And I just for it inadvertent comedy elements. I quite I love that little bit of dialogue between the two. I mean, we might as well do this. <laughs> yeah, because I, I like seeing the relationships deteriorate. You know, you get a feel that the characters are unravelling, particularly Heather, by the point you know, where we get her famous speech with the, the drippy nose. She yeah. thought it was a delightfully unflattering uh, scene for her. Yeah, I feel like we do get the sort of sense of the group struggling. I mean, I like when we get the moments we bond as well. It was quite a touching one, you know, we're talking about the food they miss and stuff, you know, they just really duked yeah. it out and that's how they, you know, they're like, look, we're stuck with each other, we have to try and get on with each other because, you know, we're fucked, and it was, you know, yeah. we, let, let, at least let's try, and, let's try and work together, particularly as, and this is one of the things that just slightly irritates me, Mike is such a moaning cunt from the beginning of the <laughs> Like, you just give the idea that, and this is quite good characterization. You give the idea that he's like leeching off her for a good grade. You know, <laughs> he's like, uh, heaven knows what she's doing. You know, and her kind of enthusiasm is a good contrast. But like the the bit with the map, uh, it was too obvious a plot device there. There, you know, he's like, oh yeah, go rid of the map, derp, right? And uh, I just sort of thought, no real person would do this. You do hate. Mike, at that mm. precise moment in the yeah. film. And I'd say that it does stretch your suspension of disbelief, but the, the actors, they do sell it. And I think if there's a setup <laughs> earlier on, there's uh, that he's looking at the, let me see the map, let me see the map. They show him the map, and he says, this is all Greek to me. And then she says to him, you wanted to see the map. But with uh, jo- Joshua... I I, want, I kind of want, wanted to get a bit more of him. You know, he's just kind of the third person there. We don't really... Yeah. We know that he's a bit underprepared, you know, where he doesn't really know how a camera works at the beginning, right? But when he's the one that they, that they uh, drag off and, like, kill, you know, when the teeth thingy, thingies show up, you know, I sort of thought, like, it should have been Mike who dies because we knew him better, and also because he annoyed me. <laughs> I did think some of the argument scenes did kind of drag they're slightly longer than they needed to be which for an 80 minute film isn't a great sentence to say but at the same time like you got so many other elements right uh, what about yourself Jim you've been relatively quiet over there what you what you pondering yeah well going to the length of the film absolutely great that it's 80 minutes and as you say, there are a couple of arguments in there that do feel a bit too sustained. But other than that, the pacing is absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. You start off with the, you know, the getting to know them. Then you've got the documentary shots. We slowly get into the woods. Uh, we spend the first night. Things are a bit creepy. So, you know, I believe uh, it's Josh said he, he was woken up in the middle of the night because he just kept hearing like cackling and stuff. Uh, that, that's a really good setup. And then 
you know, we get further and further through it, you start seeing the effigies, the rocks, and so on, and things just get creepier and creepier. And every night, it's more and more disturbed. Just the whole build-up to everything just goes so swiftly. It's, it's brilliant. And for a film that's supposed to look know, rough around the edges, it's all shot on handheld, and it's, they're, they're running around the woods. I've got to say, the framing of that film is absolutely brilliant like, it doesn't feel like there's a single shot wasted mm-hmm. uh, and to say that it's supposed to look you know like it's it's amateur and so <laughs> it's, yeah it's probably not supposed to look as brilliant as it does but going back to the bit where you mentioned heather's scene where she's like crying into the camera you know she's yeah. scared and all that you can't take your eyes off it can you it's just you're absolutely laser focused on on that and just there's loads of moments like that that just keep you just absolutely yeah. hooked it moves pretty much at a breakneck speed uh, even mm. though it's basically walking <laughs> for most of it um it just whizzes through yeah i was just gonna say about the uh the signature scene of the camera being held up and it's unflatteringly you see heather's nose i think her acting in that and her despair and she talks about the responsibility that she feels for letting down like Josh's mum, her mum, Mike's mum, she let down everyone and like she's, this is a girl with the weight on her shoulders and what I like is that if the acting had not been as good, then all the audience would have been focusing on is the dribbly notes. Whereas you're actually, you are actually buying that performance and taking on board how like terrible she feels that everything's gone wrong. And as soon as they enter the woods, everything went beyond their control. I want to say very quickly, during one of the arguments, unfortunately I forget which one now, but it was quite late into the film. And I think, do you remember when, I think it's the guy Mike's got the camera and he's going up to uh, Heather and he keeps saying, you're lost in the woods. There's your motivation. You don't know how to get home. There's your motivation. <laughs> he's, he's just tormenting her. It's I think it's after that, but it's, it's during one of these arguments where one of the guys has the camera, because even though she's the main character, Heather's actually behind the camera for most of the film. But the camera's on her at one point. The guy's got the camera, and great line of dialogue, this, if you bite me one more time. <laughs> I just love that dialogue in the middle of an argument. <laughs> yeah, because obviously she's a girl, she's going to fight a little differently from how a guy would. Um, yeah, it's when they're running through the darkness and she shouts so what the hell is that? Apparently oh, there, God, yeah. I've heard there was something there that the, the, crew, the crew had prepared and they didn't quite catch it. And apparently, I don't know if they did multiple takes, but that was apparently the best one, and you never see it. But it, uh, you know, it does lead to your imagination. Yeah, to fill the, in the blank. So it's interesting, no, because I would have just assumed it was by design that we don't see it because we see so little here. Like, it's interesting that it's about a third of the way through the film when we get the first scare sequence, and as far as the scare sequences go, there's really not that many of them. We the main ones we have are wake up to stick men in the morning. A late night chase sequence for teeth. Then we come to the entire ending part of the house with a sort of little handprints. At least when there's a lot of hands like shaking the tent or tapping the tent. Oh yes, yes. Is that, is that not the same bit as the chase sequence? I could, I could be misremembering that. But that well, it might be when they get out and run away. It could be that one. Yeah, like that yeah. whole atmosphere was just uh, absolutely spot on. I think the entire last sequence is is phenomenal. Uh, you know, the, the whole section of the house. I said uh, first time I watched it, it was absolutely terrifying. You know, watching it now as an adult, it's um, you know, it's still it's still quite scary. Yeah. Uh, any negatives we want to be bringing in here? Um, I mentioned some arguments going for long than necessary. Yep. Uh, Mike being a money cunt. Yep, and, jo- and Josh feeling a bit less developed than the others. I say there's maybe a couple of continuity issues. Or certainly in the, if this is meant to be like raw footage that has been untampered with, there's certainly parts where, at the beginning, you remember when uh, Heather's crossing the log for the very first time, mm. and you hear her voice like she's talking. Basically, her lips aren't moving. This is uh, ADR'd uh, dialogue that's been put in post production. And there's also, I think, the opening sequence where she's like, this is my home, this is is my living room, and her makeup's all done. And she gets in the car, they go pick up another one of the crew, 
and then they go to their first location and she's applying her makeup in the wing mirror of a car <laughs> which should already be on because I saw it on earlier um, so it, there's but the thing is because they like to toy with the audience psychologically it's one I can't fully put down to a goof it mm. might be intentional there are goofs in uh, Blair Witch 2 which I'm looking forward to getting to <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah this one certainly had moments that sort of made me think but because of the nature of the Blair which I can't fully put it down to a goof it might be something just to mess with the audience I think it's a really interesting point for the first one I mean for both interesting points of course but I think the uh, point about uh, the tension between is this raw footage or not right and yeah, it is strange that there's still an editing process that's been applied to them, which I assume is just to make a film more visually interesting. But it isn't. But you're right; it isn't consistent with just here's the tapes, and we're just showing what what was on the tapes in order. Rather, what we're getting is uh, you know here's an edited version of what was on the tapes. Here, here's your highlights. Here's your greatest <laughs> hits. <laughs> but yeah, I, d- I did like the Heather's personality. Her enthusiasm is such that when when the camera is on all the way through it. Makes sense. Because mm-hmm. it's becoming such a, 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 I guess, a tropey question now of, well, why is the camera still on? It didn't annoy me in Blair Witch Project like it does in some other horror films. Yeah. You know, you get somewhere the characters are being intentionally performative to the camera. Like, my personal favourite film footage is the uh, Big Finish. And in the Big Finish, they're performing all the way through it on camera. You know, you've had a few like that, or like The Last Horror Story does the same thing because it's told from a killer's perspective. You know, it makes sense that uh, you would have him, like, filming every detail. But then we're watching something like Cloverfield, which just gets around it in a much less elegant way. I mean, fucking Cloverfield, they leap over roofs carrying this camera. <laughs> you know? like, yeah, <laughs> camera survives the helicopter crash. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Why are you still filming at that point? Yeah, absolutely. A really small part, but I can help but think this. Somebody needed to suggest following the river to get out of the woods. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I get that they could, they could have them following it and then it not, like, they just find themselves still nowhere, like, going back to the same place. That would be really cool, in fact. It would be really effective is if they followed the river and then still wound up back at that log. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to say another thing about this film is that with horror films, a lot of characters don't always make decisions that are entirely sensical. Um, because we have to have them all killed off in interesting ways. And following the river aside, most of what they do makes sense. Yeah, it's a logical through line in this film that I do appreciate for horror movies. And I, I imagine after a few days of not eating and being lost and being tormented, your decisions are going to be a little questionable anyway, regardless of what situation you're in. You know, the River Point does remind me the Blair Witch Project game is uh, it's pretty good. And um, something that I really enjoy about the game is it's got a randomly kind of generated map, or, or it's the same bit, and the connections are, gener- are randomly generated. So you, so you follow the river, but you always end up at the same spot. Like, you always <laughs> just end up doubling back on yourself unless you go to a very particular location to advance into the next section of the map. And it's so good for just completely discombobulating you as a player. You're like, I can't learn the layout of this map because the map makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so recommended. As you with the game, the uh, last couple of hours are a little bit too plot-heavy, just where you just get lots and lots of cutscenes and it kind of pulls you out of it a bit, but... There's some good background there. Uh, and again, ref- bits that are referred to in the documentary show up in the uh, video game as well, so that was really cool. Anything else you want to say about this film? Like, I, it's, it's, you know, it's, so much has been said in the past, I don't know if we're necessarily going to be bringing a whole lot of new things to the Blair Witch Project, but basically, I really enjoyed this. I liked the escalation. I liked just the sense of how fucked they are in, during Act 1. And then that allows the scares in Act 2 to have a lot more impact. And then, you know, Act 3, once we've had um, uh, Mike go missing, I I think it just manages to somehow step up a notch all over again. It does all this without any jump scares, without having Mm -hmm. music and things even in it. It's just, yeah. Uh, Basically, I I really enjoy this film, and I was delighted that we chose to go with this one because it meant I got the chance to rewatch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. And I think it's one of those films that could only have been made when it was made. Yeah. 
it mm. came out at the right time, as we've already met, touched on, at that cusp of the internet being there, but not being the tool it is today. So I remember seeing a lot of uh, hype on the TV about it, you know, like film shows, interviews and stuff. I even remember seeing, I can't remember if it was a, another one of those documentaries trying to show that it's real. Um, there was a woman went to see it, maybe it was a can. And she'd come out crying at the end of it. She was that shaken up. <laughs> it's the scariest film ever. <laughs> I think I watched this for the first time when it was first shown on TV. And the only thing I could remember about it was the ending. You know, that, that's how good it, that end bit is. So it was really good to watch it. I think, yeah, this would have been the first time I've watched it now since... I think it was shown on TV around 2000, maybe 2001. But yeah, just... To see it hold up, it you know it's only shot on handheld cameras, and they look better than, say, you found footage films from ten years later with you know, the, the, the newer digital and so. It's, it's just something about it. It just looks so much better. It's so well made, and yeah, you know, just it's very much of a time and place that couldn't have been made at any other point, and it just seems to just be perfect for what it is just to maybe finish up one well, that um the ending it doesn't tie everything up in a neat bow the ending's open to interpretation a lot of people are not clear what happened and but it leaves people i would presume leave the audience leave the, the cinema thinking about the film mm. wondering what happened it, it gives the it gives the audience something to think about and i would say in that sense when the film ends it's still it still haunts the viewer. Oh, absolutely. And it encourages you to want to learn more as well. It encourages you mm -hmm. to do the background reading and things like that. Yeah. And it encourages you to watch the documentary. Let's come to star ratings on this one. What are we going to be giving this one? Alistair, let's kick off with yourself. I'm going to go four and a half for this one. Fair enough. See, I'm, I'm really torn of this one. Actually. Going into this, I was like, this is a four star film. I think I've kind of even talked my way, myself up to a five. I just, I just think to myself, you know, um, maybe it's more about the the greatness of the movie, I suppose, rather than and like its influence, rather than like mm. just objectively what it is. You know, a bit like Halloween isn't my favorite slasher film, but you still recognize that as such a great, important piece of work, yeah. and. Um, you know, I think Blair Witch Project, it has the same kind of importance as something like Halloween does. Uh, I guess like with fine footage, fine footage isn't a genre in the same way that um, the same way that slashers are. I think of fine footage as being a storytelling technique, because you can still have subgenres within fine footage. Like, you know, you go, well, here's our zombie fine footage films with Wreck. You know, you go, like, here's our uh, flesh-eating virus uh, fine footage with uh, The Bay, for example. You know, you've got quite a lot of ways that you can tell different stories types of story with fine footage and Blair Witch is the benchmark by which all fine footage films are basically judged and so yeah I think I'm actually going to have to go up to five what about yourself Jim what do you reckon uh, at face value definitely four out of five like the a cracking film very tight very lean uh, not perfect by any means perhaps lacking a little in tension and scares for a good deal of it as well but yeah just solid four out of five for me Hey, well, if we go from a uh, film that got uh, four, four and a half and five to a film that I do not think is going to get, be getting that. Can well, I just quickly yeah. say, just one last final thought on The Blair Witch is basically that even though we could say it's a flawed film in some aspects, that actually adds to its authenticity because we, you're, the audience is sold right off the bat. This is not a film made by professionals. And yeah. you go and sort of giving it that sort of leeway. With found footage films, I always find myself doing a bit of sort of role play with the material that I'm presented. I pretend that I'm like an investigator and I'm watching this movie for the first time, all these videotapes and reaching my own conclusion as to what's happened. So that sort of a little interactivity I like to have with found footage movies. Fair enough. That's that's uh, that's that's, that's, that's <laughs> like a fun way of approaching them. Uh, oh, as you mentioned, the director is so. Got Eduardo Sanchez and uh, Daniel Merrick. Daniel Merrick didn't really seem to do anything after this. So Eduardo Sanchez, who's seen, uh, did uh, Altered, which I thought was a bit shit. Good premise, not particularly good film. Uh, Lovely Molly, I thought, had some potential to it, though that was all right. 
and uh, I believe he was one of the directors. He'd done quite a lot of TV. He did Yellow Jackets. Oh, and a Bigfoot movie called Exist, which I wasn't a fan of either. Basically, I just like it's inconsistent. I think a very inconsistent director that did this really great film early on in his career, and uh, you know, I'd love to see love to see another film like this. Oh, uh, by the way, another great found footage, Lake Mungo, a totally different vibe from Blair Witch Project, and it's, uh, you know, very different kind of movie, still uses the same techniques. Anyway, speaking of films that uh, are completely different from Blair Witch Project, let's move on to Book of Shadows, Blair Witch Project 2. On October 27th, forget everything you've heard. Forget everything you've seen. Because this time, the truth is scarier than fiction. <laughs> Book of Shadows, Blair Witch Project 2. So, I gotta tell you guys, I'm gonna be quite biased on this one. When I was a teenager, for literally months, we had this system of a bunch of us, we'd hang out, we'd get some beers underage or some... Um, some maybe some some weed and we'd hang out, smoke smoke and drink and uh and watch Blair Witch Project 2 and have a curry. You know, there'd be a point where we could basically do a karaoke <laughs> of the entire movie. I, I've always had this as a guilty pleasure, like this, Rocky Four and Commando are my kind of favorite kind of tra uh, trash trash pieces basically. Um <laughs> so I mean this is not a good movie at no. all. It's, it's not high cinema. Now, I'm going to give a couple of predictions here. Uh, my predictions about the way Jim's going to respond to those se these sequels. I reckon Jim is probably not going to like Blair Witch 2, but will like it more than either of us, Alistair. And I reckon, <laughs> I reckon Jim is also going to have a really mental opinion on the third one, where he's like, ah, oh, it's probably the best of the franchise. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, am I right about that, well, Jim? Like, what do you think of Blair Witch Project 2? We don't have to talk about the third one at all yet. Um, it's funny, Alistair mentioned closing out the Blair Witch Project. You can tell it's, it's supposed to look unprofessional. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can say the same thing about Book of Shadows as well. It's extremely unprofessional. I mean, it, uh. it, it didn't start well and continued down that path. I think it's the most... Y2K looking film I've yeah. ever seen. Yeah. Like, you, you don't even need to know what it is. You could take away all the title card and the credits and everything. Just play it and you're immediately taken back to the year 2000. Yeah, mm. It's cram packed full of crap new metal. Uh, the, the cinematography is absolutely abysmal. And the direction, I was actually quite surprised to see this was a, someone that had made films before but oh, not yes. just yeah. music videos he's you know? a very very accomplished director joe berlinger yeah. you know, he's um you see the stuff that he's made he, he, it's mostly documentaries the paradise lost trilogy would be his uh, main calling card you know and um although he did that, that movie extremely wicked shockingly evil and vile uh in the one about uh, is it uh yeah uh Ted, Ted, Ted Bundy, Bundy, is it? It? yeah yeah I <laughs> with uh with that guy from high school musical i believe yeah. um, <laughs> But uh, oh, and, and he did. He did. Uh, he did this really good documentary about Metallica, some kind of monster. Mm, yeah, it, it's <laughs> so like fair play to Metallica. The absolute bravery of them actually letting him put that film out. Like it, they come across as so like it's like watching The Office or something at points with Spinal Tap. Like they come across as <laughs> so ridiculous and self-important. I absolutely adore that. So yeah, it's a shame that this is such a, a piece of shit. He's cited studio. <laughs> Uh, studio interference um but the thing is i don't believe you can make a good film with this footage anyway like uh he says at the beginning you know when you've got the marilyn manson track apparently he was originally going with uh frank sinatra witchcraft which we did and he didn't want to include the little bits of violence during the credit sequence i think it would have been a better opener but at the same time, I also don't think it would have made it an amazing film. I think the, yeah. the footage interspliced at the beginning just gives away everything you're going to watch yeah, later. Yeah, really does. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is build intrigue of what's going to happen here, but on the other hand, you're also undermining the story of what's coming. Mm -hmm. um, and all, the, all the money shots. Because we had no soundtrack or music or anything in the first Blair Witch. Tonally, the difference in this is from 
like Tim Burton's Batman to then Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin. That's <laughs> the tonal shift between these two films. Although I could, I, I do actually enjoy Batman and Robin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the, that makes one the, of I, us. I, I can kind of see the studio interference as far as the soundtrack's concerned because I don't think there was a horror film made between maybe 99 and 2003 that didn't have a mandatory new metal soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> 13 um, Ghosts springs to mind. <laughs> and, yeah, it just looked so much like this guy had come from making videos for the Spine yeah. Shank and Corn. Because uh, the opening, like, you've got the... Uh, Supplies to give a bit of news reports and uh, other documentary bits. And then we get to our main characters. And you have these weird little flashback things about their, you know, being in the mental asylum and yeah. so on. And I, I, I don't know, was I watching an episode of Charmed or something else from that era? In fact, those TV shows from that era look better than this film. Mm-hmm. Like, did the studio also interfere with like, what cinematographer they had, <laughs> what cameras they used? It just looked so... For a film that's come off the back of a low-budget independent film where they used handheld cameras, this looks cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What I will say is I did quite enjoy the opening sort of interstitial sequence of news reports and talking about the first Blair Witch as a movie that exists within the universe of this film. I think it's necessary to establish that it's not another found footage film. This is a, we're doing a, you know, quote-unquote straight-up movie here, but the initial film features as a movie within this one, similar to how uh, Season of the Witch features shots of the first Halloween film. But if I can just take the moment to kind of go for the jugular on this film. First of all, Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows, Throughout this entire film, there is no Book of Shadows. (laughs) See, I was going to mention that, but I wasn't sure if I'd zoned out at any point and they happened to have it. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I can see. The only way to make this make sense is if the Book of Shadows you refer to is the book of notes that Tristan and Stephen have, but I... It's not by definition no, a book. It's a big no. pile of paper, so that can that can fuck off. <laughs> your, your your film's got real problems if one of the issues is the title itself. Uh, yeah, I mean the thing is, even if that was the book of shadows you're referring to, it is not clear if that's what you're referring to. And, Nobody and, ever uh, says book of shadows. At no, no point is there a volume of text that is in any way relevant to character motivation. Or it's not a MacGuffin. It, it's just it's not. What the fuck does book, book of Shadows even mean either? It's like saying, like, oh, yeah, it's like a keyboard of jelly. Like, you know, it's just a completely <laughs> arbitrary kind of title. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to co- have to correct, correct you on something. This is going to make the film even worse, right? Oh, is, don't. Keep in mind that this wasn't pitched as straight-up film. This was pitched, for some reason, as TV dramatization, right? And you're like, hold on. This in no way resembles... A dramatization, right? This resembles a big budget horror film, right? Yeah. If, this is a, if this is a TV dramatization, we wouldn't see the story from their perspective at all. We would just see, we would just see uh, the story the story of him killing Tristan, right? So, um, yeah, it, oh, it, man. it doesn't I, right. make any sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to continue with my going for the jugular here on some aspects. <laughs> now, what I'm about to point out can only be interpreted as goofs. Bearing in mind that we have a number of characters who are specifically shown to have unreliable recollections of events, and we are dealing with a film that has a bewildering array of flash-forwards and flashbacks. Now, when Tristan, presumably possessed by the Blair Witch, um, and and you see what happens on the crazy night where they shred all their own stuff, you see her putting the tapes into the wall... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she's filming this on a camera, the tape of which itself was found in that wall where she put it. It's like, that does not compute no. on any level. And another one that... And this, this, these are two that I just spotted on this watch as well. I had <laughs> noticed it on previous ones, but... All right, so the rest of them, they strip down naked, they run off to see the other tour group, 
Um, and in my notes, I do have kind of very feeble representation of uh, a Japanese couple and a German woman very much playing up to stereotypes there. But anyway, the other tour group get killed. They get disemboweled. Disemboweled, Jeffrey. Disemboweled. Must have hurt. <laughs> and then put into a pentagram shape. Now, the flash forwards very clearly show, and if I've got this wrong, please correct me, but the sequence of events that I have in my head is this. They run up to them, pick up rocks, bash their heads in to knock them out. They then strip them down naked, then disembowel them, then put them into the pentagram. So, but the point they're in the pentagram shape, they should be naked. However, in the photograph that the police officer oh, has, yeah. they're all fully <laughs> dressed. So, I mean, and I can't. Am I, why on earth would you then put their clothes back on, but specifically tear holes out of the stomach region of their T-shirts to expose the wounds? I, God, I mean, yeah, it's, that is fucking stupid. The only thing I have for this is that there was very specific sort of nudity clauses for all of the actors, and I think the creators might have wanted to go down the nudity route, but the actors didn't want to get naked and it seems like there's a negotiation going back and forth with let's just say all the main cast and the creators as far as the basic premise goes well i do think there's something to this with uh, you know addressing the legacy of the original one making a mm -hmm. film that's almost kind of making fun of the sequel and i like the basic setup of saying well we have uh, some academics we have a goth, we have a witch, and we have a grifter, right? And uh, they, they're the people who are all going to be impacted one way or another by the film coming out. That in itself is relatively neat. And I also did like the um, the sort of basic thing of a tour group where where they're, they're going to celebrate a work of fiction and then come away from it going, oh, we actually this we've actually just stumbled across a real Blair Witch. You know, that that in itself I thought was a good idea. And to be fair, as far as if you had to plan what a Blair Witch sequel would look like, I think that premise is actually quite a solid one. It's just everything about mm -hmm. the delivery of this. Like the, like, the acting of this is absolutely terrible. Yeah. And to the point where it makes the bad dialogue seem even worse. Like when you've got lines like, uh, when that fucking tree that appears yeah, yeah. Uh, and Jeff has to pretend that he's like surprised by this it just doesn't work right then later he goes yeah I told you there was some, something pretty fucked up about that tree or whatever right and you're like hold on this is maybe the stupidest scare sequence that's ever been conceived by anyone right and it's not being sold well at all no. Like, it's such a kitchen sink approach to scares. We're like, all right, so we've got dogs, right? We've got, like, ghost kids. We've got a, an enchanted tree, you know, we've got a naked <laughs> woman outside. We've got, a, for some reason, a 1930s nurse in the hospital, right? You know, and a uh, ghost kid there, right? And uh, we've got all these random shots of violence and, like, and this owl. <laughs> <laughs> like it just sort of feels like there's no real coherence to the iconography it's just Owls a bunch scary. of shit <laughs> <laughs> I mean can we all at least agree that when the goth girl um, is that's a stupid sequence of her eating the owl and, oh, then, it, and then it turns yeah. out to a, a leg and of KFC I don't know what they were going for there but it was just a really stupid sequence and, she, and she's tr there's no elegant way to eat a leg of chicken. Yeah, the actress tries to keep looking pretty while she's eating a leg of chicken. Oh, fuck, I mean, she was the worst actor, actually, in the film, in fact, not even, Je not even Jeff, like, she had the worst material to work with when you, you got the whole bit uh, that hinges upon her knowing that uh, Tristan's pregnant or knowing where the tapes are, and she's like, I just know. Right, like, this is just... <clears throat> It's a silly way of advancing the story in quite a blatant plot device that she's got this ability. And it seems even stupider when you've got like this kind of very vacant delivery behind uh, it. Yeah, her character... I mean, if you remove her character from the film, what have you actually lost there? This is someone that... The, the goth person, and I think we're playing up to sort of cultural stereotypes there, um, where she just says things that weird people out, but they meet her at a graveyard... How did she get to the graveyard? Is that really the most efficient pickup place for the tour? Oh, that was so funny meeting her there. And like her, the, the, one of my favorite bits is her casual and she goes, I hate nature. <laughs> like, what? Like, what? Why are you here? What are you yeah. doing? 
fuck is Kevin Blair Witch Project? If you hate nature, while well, you're about to get a whole wallop of that on this tour into the woods. <laughs> Oh, God, yes. Yeah, her, her and Jeff both utterly terrible. Wait, what about you can Stephen? sort of act as Tristan? What oh, Stephen, Stephen, yeah. Because you pointed this out where there was a line of dialogue he delivers so badly. And this is, I think, when they're chasing down Tristan and the, the ending part for her character. And he delivers a line what's like, oh, yeah, what about you? It's something to that effect. It was, it was I'm not a witch. He's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> I just couldn't give a fuck. <laughs> like I refuse to believe that was the best take. Was it, did <laughs> Jeff have an accent change at some point? Yeah, the bit where he goes, uh, just goes into, I didn't kill us, Stephen. <laughs> like this, he goes back to his standard accent. You're like, is the character doing that, or is the actor doing that? <laughs> like by accident? I don't, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of, um, I think the little, they're doing it just for the scares. But it adds nothing to the plot. Like the owl that we've talked about adds nothing to the plot. When Erica and Stephen start getting a bit cozy with each other, and then she randomly cuts his uh, chest open with her nails, and then they cut back <laughs> to reality. I think, okay, what did that have to do with anything? Like anything at all? What did that link to? What was the significance of that? Yeah, I think we have far too many of those moments of, I don't know, uh, are they under the witch's curse or just hallucinating from their night in the woods or whatever? There's just so many things that happen that turns out didn't happen. And then occasionally you'll see probably the witch kind of doing that weird, awkward, backwards dad dance yeah. and then vanishing into thin air. And that's literally all you see of the witch. Just doing that a couple of times, and that's it. There's just so many moments like that that you just think, well, okay. And that doesn't advance things any further. doesn't add to anything other than maybe just a bit of gore here and there, just for the uh-huh. sake of it. It's not even you know, remotely tense or scary. No. Um, no. But the, I think the scariest part of the film was where they were starting to get wasted around the campfire. It's one of the cringiest things i've ever seen in anything it was just i, I felt embarrassed watching that bit. <laughs> the sort of natural flowing dialogue of the first film has not translated to this one <laughs> no. on any level at all and then the following morning when they're waking up from that everything's wrecked i'm pretty sure you see a crew member in two different shots. Oh, do you? Like this, uh, <laughs> where they're looking. Surprised. Yeah, they're looking for the tapes, and then you clearly see someone in like a blue puffer jacket or something in the background. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's one of the other, you know, uh, tour group coming back to see them because they're lost or whatever. But no, it's obviously a crew member because that's all you see of them. And then, like in another shot, about. 20 seconds later, yeah. there's someone else stood behind the trees in like an orange jacket or something. And then again, I'm thinking, is this going to be them? But no, it leads to nothing. So even the fucking crew and that just obviously yeah. don't care. <laughs> also, I want to point out with the, even though she's probably the best actress in it, the Tristan actress, that she has a conversation with a goth girl about being pregnant. And, but this is when they're on their way to that, that ruined house. And I'm sure that after she's had the conversation where she, the, act, the character knows she's pregnant, she then indulges in alcohol and drugs with everyone else. <laughs> and like, you, you, can't, you lose all sympathy for this person. And she starts having nightmares about a miscarriage. Yeah. And you think, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we get a strange um, abundance of crotch shots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, the, when they wheeled her into the hospital and the camera's focused on her bloodied crotch and then later on after she's hung herself, the camera's positioned directly beneath her up to her, her spinning feet. I, I, I just, why the camera ended up in that position with that actress so many times unnecessarily. <laughs> it's just a lot of weirdly framed shots that are in this. I kind of do like the idea of having that sort of old factory as a setting. I like that. Mm. It just nothing like I want to see it in a better film. When we mentioned earlier the camp scene, I think this is a really good way of distinguishing between the first and second movie and what makes them work and what doesn't, right? Where 
they have a camp sequence in the first one where they're, just, they're doing that sort of joke about, like, you know, who's a captain, that sort of thing, right? It comes across as very organic, and the characters are quite likeable, and it feels like we're bonding. In this, like, they've got, they just got a bunch of shit jokes with each other. Like, uh, when Stephen does that one about um, uh, how many hevers did it take to change the light bulb? Just one! Right, you're like, is that, how does that even function as a joke? I don't really understand. Is it just because he screamed? Like, you could also scream, it's ju- scream, it's just seven. I don't know. But, like, <laughs> um, but then, then they're going, ah, oh, yeah, you know, hey, two guys, and two girls and a guy. I mean, why didn't they bang, right? <laughs> you, like, it just felt like the most superficial way of addressing mm. the first movie. And yeah. they just, and then, like, suddenly Stephen's personality transplant when uh, he's like, we're going to drink all night and, like, you know, doing a big bro collie bucky thing. It's just a, of Edinburgh slang for giving someone a piggyback and I don't buy that Stephen to make that transition since he's been like the tight ass throughout for, for the uh, earlier part here you know we went, and is like I just want to sit down and talk about intellectual things with my partner because that's all us academics mm-hmm. do is talk about our work right and um, yeah like we didn't feel like there was much character consistency I didn't think anyone was well I, I didn't think uh, their banter was very organic and it just felt really lacking. You didn't have the same kind of camaraderie that we have in the first one, or like the, or at least yeah. like the kind of familiarity with how they interact. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it it didn't help that the level of acting was cable porn. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't fix the television. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I think if they had maybe some better actors, potentially it could have been a better film, but. You know, they no one seemed interested whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, like it's a sequel yeah. to a worldwide phenomenon, and yeah, I know I I understand that it's a rushed film. Like they wanted to get it out as soon as cash in on the success and so on. And it's like a year directly after the original film came out. But the amount of directions they could have taken this in, mm. and this is what they land on, and. For it to be this bad as well, it's just, it's unreal. <laughs> I, I mean, some, it's, it's one actor I'm going to compliment, right? La- Larry Flaherty, who plays the fat sheriff, um, he also, <laughs> also plays the role of the fat sheriff in uh, Signs as well. He was the best part of this yeah. movie, right? Like, I loved how he's kind of struggling with to get every last word out, you know, is <laughs> sort of really slow. Slow antagonistic delivery yeah. that he has and when he speeds Such up it has it has great impact <laughs> when obviously jeff answers the phone it's like come out and meet me as like, i'm not going down to the station i'm at your front door you twerp oh when he appears <laughs> in the background of the telly as well <laughs> <He's been waiting. laughs> right by the way this is a sheriff <laughs> law enforcement waving at suspects <laughs> through a journalist <laughs> through the, the television through their cameras. Uh, like the level of unprofessionalness involved to take that action is jaw dropping. But I kinda despite myself, I love that it's in this film. And and there's the crime scene directly behind them as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like what you He's talking to Kim, he's like, you think your black clothes and your makeup give you power? <laughs> and Sadie's just a scared, cowardly little girl. Like, he just... Yeah. The actor must have had such fun with this. You know, he is playing the baddie, and he just... He relishes this, this but, role. It's also the thought that the victims, the crime scenes in the background when a sheriff waves into the camera at the suspects. But <laughs> would the families of the deceased also be watching that same broadcast? And when they see him wave, what do you think? Is this he waving at me? <laughs> oh, so fucking unprofessional. He's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but he was by far the best performer in this movie. Yeah. The funniest delivery of the film, except for the uh, uh, Stephen saying, yeah, you are, will be Jeff going, this, this makes no sense. Like, when we're talking oh, about yeah. rewinding the, the tape, because it's such a stupid idea. We go, oh, what we got to do is, so if you play the tape backwards, and then they're like, all right, now, now we suddenly see everything. <laughs> like, like that was when you write write yourself into into a plot hole. You know, you're just going like, all right, well, w- w- what am I going to do? Maybe if you reverse it, uh, you know, like that. It's got a that'll do feel about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
this is such a slapdash film. I was just marvelling at how we, we moan about the, say, studio interference in this film, but when you consider what the film is, that's probably why there's studio interference. They're trying to add mm. spice to a bland film, even though, I mean, the fundamentally, the studio notes was counterintuitive and undermining what little tension there was in this film. But um, you can't help but, it's like, who would watch this film and not have notes? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of something that could redeem it, but I think the only part of the film I enjoyed was the reveal at the end, where mm-hmm. conveniently Jeff's factory house has video cameras set up yeah, in all the rooms. Yeah. And it turns out that they did do all the killing and they were just under the witch's spell doing her bidding and yep. yeah it was really i don't know what the word is well shit really <laughs> for that being the best part of the film in my opinion just goes to show how bad the rest of the film is <laughs> in the first player witch there's a line of dialogue that i loved if you bite me one more time in this one and this is just the epitome of why i don't like this film right so it's the line of dialogue spoken by Stephen, this is after they've hung Tristan, he turns to the camera and goes, which bitch? And you're like, yeah, those words rhyme. So you go like, fucking <laughs> witch? <laughs> like, it's really that, but he also says, which bitch? Oh, that's amazing. Or maybe that's before he pushes her over the, the edge. Oh, in, in either case, it's, it's not a good line. I love the movie ends with him shouting, this is bullshit. <laughs> 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 yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'm gonna give another quick compliment here, right? A couple of a couple of okay things. I liked the woman with the whole cart of yogurt. No reason for her to be there. <laughs> that scene I quite like. They they do come up with an odd year in the countryside now type, uh, almost mm. um, little Britain vibe. Yeah, I guess it's kind of to contrast with the goth girl, because, you know, they think she's weird, she thinks they're weird, so it's the whole clash of culture, isn't it? Between her and Peggy. (laughs) You know, when you've got that really unerotic scene between Erica and Stephen, like two people who, they have such little tension, you'd assume they're brother and sister, right? And um, (laughs) there's one quite cool bit where after you've had her ripping his chest... It then cuts to the room and both of them have clearly just had a shared fantasy. I thought that was quite interesting. You know, she's checking her nails, he's checking his chest. I thought, that was okay. Just one of those interesting little details. I'll tell you another interesting little detail. Jeff keeps his coffee in the fridge. <laughs> I don't know why the fuck anyone would oh, do yeah. that. Yeah. It is a very poorly stocked factory. <laughs> for, 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 for this being a place where someone lives... He, he's barely got food for one for a day. <laughs> I, I thought the interviews as a wraparound was okay as well. Like, we realised quite early on that Tristan isn't there, so we can guess that something bad's going to happen that involves her. Mm. But I thought that, uh, like, we don't know who called the police, because it doesn't make any sense that any of them would call the police. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, it's... Good that we have the interrogations just kind of like it's almost like the hype man, it's like saying something's gonna happen, right? And uh, it creates like a nice mystery hook for the film. It's a, a mystery that's ultimately underwhelming, but at the same time, I thought the idea was there, there's a cool structure to it. It makes it even less like a real dramatization, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much so. You guys got anything good you want to say about this one? As I said, it's extremely Y2K. Mm -hmm. Um, That is to its detriment, but also is slightly endearing as well. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Like The soundtrack is as generically 2000 as it comes. I did did notice Dragula was in the credits, but I didn't remember hearing it. That's that's all I've got to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, as far as the uh, charm of it goes, you know, I, 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 like, I can't get myself to hate this film because it is sort of a guilty pleasure, basically. But it doesn't succeed at all at what it's trying to do. You know, the character tensions are so, like, they just escalate like that. You know, there's, there's nothing, nothing feels real about it. Like, any charm that it's got is unintentional. 
And also, it's another point I wanted to make, right? See Stephen's defense when he was like, it was an accident, I swear to Christ, it was an accident, right? And he's, because yeah. he was he was goaded into pushing her. The thing is, even the footage from his version is still clearly first-degree murder. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like whichever way you look at it, he, he killed her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, like, she's going like, Oh, tell t- tell you what, you don't have the balls to push me. She's like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> like, like, he proved her wrong. Like, you're like, uh, mate, like none of the others should be defending you right now. That was that yeah. was a horrible thing to do. I love when you've got the sheriff. You know, he's got Jeff, and they're like walking into a police station. He's like a bit of straw. Ah, <laughs> uh, Cravens. He did, like fuck it. He uh, he deserves his own spin off. Like <laughs> just like see like him as a. It's like, you know, a, a small town sheriff just going around solving all such silly crimes. I, I, I'd watch that. What I'll say is that there was, there was a gimmick attached to this film where there was a hidden message throughout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the version that I saw, they'd actually edited out all of, like, the, the tombstone where you meet Goth Girl that says Treacle and Kim's her name. It, it never changed. It remained as Treacle throughout. And there's a shot where Erica... She sat down some leaves and she falls back and there's a top-down camera shot of her. And I forgot, I think it's the word seek was meant to be found at that point. And it wasn't there in this version that I watched. And removing the um, that gimmick, which is one of the few things the film has going for it, 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 it leaves an absence in that the film has because... The top-down shot of Erica lying back on the leaves, that was shot specifically for the gimmick. There's no other reason you'd shoot that shot that way. You wouldn't film it that way unless you were doing that thing specifically. I think the other, you know, I think the other words were more naturally put in, but as I say, the version I saw, it just it had all of that lifted out of the film. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you had the same DVD as I do, but at, at the very end, if you sit through the credits, it comes up with, like, these are the bits that were too scary to show in the film. So uh, if you watch it backwards, you'll notice this and that and the other, and you'll find clues to more stuff. I was like, fuck that, I'm not going to watch this backwards, let alone forwards it uh, ever again. <laughs> if the message was seek me no further... Yeah, we should like happy to blight. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Another really silly line that I got to mention, right? It's this weird bit where Jeff and Stephen are taunting each other, and Stephen's going, "You know, there's some colleges that even you could get into." But for some reason, Jeff's comeback is he goes, "What do you have to do to go to yours? Brush your teeth?" Implying that he doesn't, but Stephen does. It's like that's not a very good slack off at all. <laughs> It's like uh, Derek Chisora, you know, the um, yes. famous, famous clip. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about here, just go on YouTube, look at Derek Chisora when he's, he threatens to go through someone like a laxative. <laughs> <laughs> the reaction from the other guy is priceless because it's, it's a self-defeating comeback where you, you come out of it worse. Yeah, if guys like, that's a bit of a strange analogy. Because <laughs> um, he goes, I think a couple of times he says, I'm going to go through this guy. Like, in talking about in the boxing ring, I'm going to go through this guy. You know those lax tips you pop? And then, like, 20 minutes later, you have to go to the toilet. And he's, like, nodding and pointing to his opponent. Yeah, I'm going to go through this guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine Jeff, like, watching that and taking notes or something. <laughs> but, any last things here? The bridge... Be, and then the the car which she somehow drives actually well, no, she well, doesn't actually drive it back does she false memory she does, does drive it back but she, she showed in the shop because she found a I think it was a nail file and she pricks mm. her finger on it and then later on we see that she knifed Peggy in the neck no she nail filed her in the neck to death and she bumps the front of the, the van because some mysterious children appear on the road. Mm. But she gets back and drives it back to the factory. But then when we next see the van, it's mangled beyond mm. the point that it would be even drivable. Um, but then we are later on shown that the van was intact the entire time and that both of those memories were false in their own way. Yeah, really like, has a double bluff. <laughs> yeah, it, it got... It got it, it, I mean, when you're trying to think about this, this is a film that punishes you for thinking about it too much. <laughs> yeah, because 
also, the, 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 it seems that these memory distortions happen when there's a camera on, right? And that's like they're sort of, oh, see, cameras don't lie, don't lie film yeah. lies. And the Blair Witch Project was a film that lied because it said it was real. <laughs> I'm very smart, right? And that's like your kind of subtext of it. But you're like, okay, so what precisely, it, it, this isn't something the camera itself is doing here. This is got to be a whole big delusion for them. But then you can reach into the film and go, well, what if any of that was, wasn't was a false memory, essentially? Because it is that she blocked out stabbing Peggy and then just, for some reason, made up her entire journal. <laughs> like, you know, it, like I can get the idea of, okay, false memory, she killed Peggy and, and forgot about it, right? If the player, or like the witch possessed her or something like that to do this. That's fine. She imagined crashing her car but didn't and you're like well why is that part of a witch's master plan because they you go okay it's making no way out scenario but we already get get a no way out scenario when they think the bridge is broken which it isn't either so i just didn't like this aspect mm-hmm. of where you're like well there's no set rule about what's real and what isn't and there and while that leaves it open to interpretation it also just implies that there isn't an answer either and what kind yeah. of ship factory has one entrance which is a regular door <laughs> on a flimsy bridge across a, a chasm. <laughs> if you, if you spend, a, spend a dollar on the factory, <laughs> you That's some factory, that one. So we go into uh, star ratings. Has anyone else got any final points about Blair Witch Project 2? Book, or Book of Shadows Blair Witch 2, sorry, to give it its proper title? No, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give this one, and again, I can't, I can't really give this a review because I actually enjoy watching this, but it fails at everything it says out to do. Mm. Uh, it's basically a one-star film, but it's quite a funny one-star film. Yeah, I'm going to second that. Yeah. Another yeah, one-star. I, I agree. It's definitely a one-star. As I say, it, it by the end, it, I did find it kind of endearing with just mm-hmm. how of its time it was. Mm. But yeah, definitely a one-star film. It's it's dog shit. It's one of the worst follow-ups to any film I've ever seen. I, I've watched a lot of shit sequels in my time, but this one is definitely one of the worst. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. We're all in agreement. <laughs> Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, a one-star film. I'm going to read out a little quote from the director here about his response to the reviews and just how absurd this is. He goes, I underestimated how much venom there would be towards anything called Blair Witch 2. I also underestimated how much the fans of that movie really just wanted the found footage technique continued, and they really just wanted the folklore and the characters. They just wanted that to continue. My mistake, this is not a disrespect to the fans of Blair Witch 1, my mistake was trying to... I'm a documentarian of intellectual documentaries. What were people expecting? My mistake was to inject into ho- into a horror franchise some intelligence and social commentary. <laughs> I love these things. It's no disrespect, but you're too stupid to understand my film. You're like, it's like he's putting himself in a position of being beyond, being like beyond criticism here. Like, oh yeah. yeah, sorry the audience was too thick for my movie. Like, no, Joe, it was just a piece of shit. Right? <laughs> And his arrogance makes me, uh, make, it, it makes me kind of hate this film even more. <laughs> like, intelligence yeah, and social commentary. Into a zero star film. Okay. The thing is, horror has always had social commentary. It's always had an yeah. intellectual side to it. Uh, this guy didn't invent it. It's not like he's ahead of his time or anything like that. Mm. It's it just the idea of going, oh, my film was too intellectual for the dumb fuck audience that I got for it. He's like, <laughs> no, the audience isn't the problem. Like if critics and audience met and audience alike actively dislike something, that's probably quite a good sign that there's something fundamentally bad about the movie. <laughs> yeah. If the studio didn't like it because if they didn't think anyone would watch it, that's also a problem. You know, it's um, basically I, I I just think it sounds like he's, he's not learned any lesson from this whatsoever. <laughs> And that was like 2020 that you said that, by the way. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah, there wasn't, really? Even this, there wasn't even this kind of, oh, uh, yeah, you know, I took like 18 years or whatever to, uh, to think about this one. And like, you know, I, I come away and think, yeah, I would have done that differently. It's like, <laughs> sticking to my guns. It's the audience. He was stung from the backlash to that film. And 18 years, like decades later, he's still talking about it. <laughs> I wow. think he was being asked about it because the... Actually, no, because this is still quite substantially after the third one had come out. Um, so, yeah, uh, 
Joe, if you're listening to if you're listening to this, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you've got it on right now. Um, yeah, we legit didn't like your film. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. Right. Let's move things up a notch. Uh, we're gonna go to the third Blair Witch Project film, which is just called Blair Witch. What is that? The guy who uploaded this video said it was from a tape he found in the Black Hills woods. I think that might be my sister. You really think your sister could still be out there after all these years? If there is any chance I could find out what happened to her, I need to try. Blair Witch. So, this is one of those movies that I reviewed on its release date, and I kind of regret some of this. I think my review of it was overly positive, because to me, there's still a lot to like about this film. But, God, it takes a long time to really find its kind of voice, doesn't it? Like, you've got an absolutely superb last 25 minutes, I think, and, like, a really mixed bag getting to that. What it's got going for it is it's got a really good kind of punky aesthetic about it, you know? It's got, like, this high energy about it that differentiates it from the other two. But, I don't know, I, this one, this, this, on rewatch, I just simply didn't like this as much as I first did. This is, uh, Jim, this is your first time with this one, yeah? It is, yeah. Um, I, I see where you're coming from. I think the issue for me, is that I watched it too close to watching the original. Now, by no means the same film. Like, this is definitely its own thing. But immediately, like, for me, one of the red flags was it's got all this tech. It's got a camera for that angle, a camera for this limb, a camera for this, that, and the other. It's even got a drone, which is great. But for me, that kind of eliminates some of what made the original so good is that we're stripped down to just two cameras and a sound guy. Whereas this one, I feel it's a bit too convenient that, yeah, technology has progressed a lot over the last 20 years, but it's a bit too convenient for the situation. So when we do start getting on, which, you know, it does start off pretty quickly. You know, we, we get through the formalities fairly swiftly, but then we get to... Um, uh, Burkittsville and start going through the woods and that all happens really quickly but we see a lot of everything from a lot of different angles far too often uh, there's no just static shots it's this angle, this angle, this angle this guy's earpiece, that camera, the drone you know, uh, I think we get far too much of that and it's probably a bit overburdened with the tech um, I mean it's, it's not to the film's detriment I, I, I think it's a good film I just feel like, yeah, you know, everything is a bit too convenient and it's not until we start getting to, you know, the, the camping and strange things are happening. That's when it starts getting interesting. It's just up to, I'd say the first 20 or so minutes, it everything does feel a bit too convenient for me. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of world building that I wasn't a fan of here was um, the way that we don't really know the relationship between this and the first movie. So we know it's a direct sequel and we know this is uh, Heather's brother. Was the first film in this universe released at the cinema as a documentary? Or, or is this just like a kind of weird cult thing that people watch on YouTube? Like, that bit of world building, because it, it was directly acknowledging the, the existence of the footage from the first one, but it, wasn't, it didn't seem to acknowledge whether the first one was a film in that universe or not. Like, because that would change the interpretation here. Like, growing up in the shadow of a, uh, of a missing person it's potentially a really interesting angle for this, especially as you, know, you go, well, it's, it, it's Heather's brother and he barely remembers her. And you said this sort of, she's now, is she like a mythical character where people are like, oh, the woman who went missing, you know, everyone watched that documentary. Or is this like a family tragedy? We just don't really know. And uh, I, I also sort of thought the brother-sister angle just didn't really amount mm, to anything. No. I, mean, I found him to be too young. I mean, the age gap is, is 20 years. Like if, Heather's mum was 19 when Heather was born. She'd be 39 when the brother was born. Mm. I mean, I think part of this may be about who who they have making this, because like, so this was the uh, Adam Wingard movie. Now, Adam Wingard's got quite a, a varied CV. You know, with him, he's, he's, he's done uh, 
what your next would be the big one. Oh, actually, I say that's a big one. The big one would be King Kong versus Godzilla. Sorry, uh, your next for guest uh, Death Note. So like, it's a it's a mixed record. We would say. I think something that kind of unites all of his movies is there's not really a whole lot of heart or emotion to it. I mean, it doesn't help with Simon Barrett's writing style. That I think there's. I, I think there's kind of like a sort of self-conscious coolness about it at points. And it just sort of meant that the characters just... Uh, I, I would actually say the characters in this were less immediately likeable and knowable than, mm. character, than the characters in the second one, and obviously the first one. Yeah, I, f- I think there was far too much cynicism yeah. for a start. I, I mean, especially considering what, there's meant to be a personal connection with this. Like th- this is this guy's sister there trying to at least get some idea of what might have happened to her. And, you know, the the people he's got in tow with him just seem like they're taking a piss all the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, this, is meant to, this is meant to be something deeply personal for the main character. And, yeah, it did seem like a, a few of the cast were just disinterested. Mm-hmm. I also want to point out that I think on a visual level, what doesn't really work for me for this film is on rewatch. I find myself questioning, is this the same forest as the one that we saw in the first two films? And it turns out it's not. First, the for- forest we saw in the first two films, obviously it was, I forget the name of it, but um, I think the Blair Witch was filmed in Vancouver, is that right, David? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah it's up in Canada for this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. The first two, you had a very autumnal sort of the browning leaves coating the floor, coating the ground. You got um, you got that look, and you've got at least sort of three to four hundred yard vision in all directions. And this one, it's almost obnoxiously green. This forest, and there's a lot more undergrowth and bushes that you've got barely a hundred yards vision in any direction. Um, it, it just struck me this is not the same forest. The trees are different, everything's different. And, you know, it's if it's not as filmed on location as with the first one, you lose that bit of continuity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the, the continuity in terms of the feel, I said earlier that I kind of liked that it had a different sort of feel to it, but I, I, but I agree that the woods is really distracting. You know, once you're like, this probably isn't the same woods. It's very noticeably not. You know, you start looking and go, hang on, these tall trees? Like, this is, this is fucking Canada over here, right? <laughs> I did actually think the use of drone technology was quite cool, just in that uh, it allowed him to show the scale here. You know, it allowed, it allowed him to add a bit of depth with how, just how big these woods were. But I didn't, think, I didn't think as a location it was quite as well characterised. You know, I think the thing is... Winger it's here and uh, some in Barrett. Like, I think what, what they're all about is energy. You know, I think that's why it's a logical choice to be doing the uh, King Kong vs. Zilla film. Right? You want a guy who's just like, foot on the accelerator. And I just, I don't think it lends itself to this kind of suspense. I don't, like, like, where it works, and I really do think the last 25 minutes of this are fantastic. If, if once they're in the house, brilliant. Yeah. Where it works, it works. Where it doesn't work, it's just tiresome. And uh, I thought it was a lot of the big scare sequences because it relied so heavily on jump scares and the yeah. brought noises. Like, mm. it just became a bit of a slog at points. Yeah, I found the, I guess, what you could call digital static when the camera's getting knocked about and so on. Yeah. That was far too repetitive for me. I Do cameras even do that in real life? <laughs> you know, it's, I, I've... It just felt like they were using that gimmick far too much. Like they're running around, you know, dropping the camera, that sort of thing, and you're just getting a horrible green flash on the screen and the noise with it. I know it was to build up tension, but it just grated more than anything. I would say the drone gets underused. That, I think that just got included because someone thought it was a fun idea. Um, the the cameras, I mean, one thing I got I did a bit, a little bit repetitive in the first film. And, is when characters keep telling someone else to stop filming, put the camera away. And in this, because I've got the earpieces that have the cameras on them, I think that's a good excuse to eliminate having that same conversation over and over again. Mm. And it did help capture some of the stuff that was happening. But the part where they're lost in the woods and recapping, I mean, we're literally retreading old ground here. It's in a different forest, but we're retreading old ground. Uh, when the girl cuts her foot... I mean, she should have just turned back at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, um, I thought with the characters, the only one that I quite liked was uh, 
was Lane, you know, the um, long-haired scruffy kid. Uh, he had quite a good sort of incel energy about him and a kind of an unpredictability about him. I just thought he was, he was like, as an antagonist, I thought he was fun. Like, the best line of the movie is, we faked it because it's real. <laughs> I just thought it was, yeah. you know, it was a little yeah. bit like that. It's like, they introduced him as liabilities of the Burkittsville kids. Mm. Yeah, I thought, I thought they were the best bit of the movie. The rest of the characters didn't really give a shit about any of them. Yeah, I, I was the same. I, I, th- there was something definitely more. There was more of a presence about that brother and sister than the, the rest of the cast. And yeah, where where we've got the first, I guess, scare moment of when they wake up in the morning and the tents are surrounded by all the effigies and so on. That was a great moment. And then to find out that they did it was another great moment because like that that's where the distrust comes in and they you know they get they separate and then when we see them come again a bit later it's like i don't know it, it, he's been wandering for what was it five, five days, days. Uh, yeah <laughs> and they've only been there for that one day that was a great little i loved that yeah. yeah there's little bits like that that i just think you know they're they suggest that with the redraft, we could have had a, had something really cool. You know, because you've got, like, um, like during that part, we, we see what the witch can do. We see the witch is fucking with them here. Like, the time mm-hmm. travel element, I thought, was really cool as well, where they suddenly, they film the bit that we see at the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, and that, I thought, was just a really cool, uh, it's a really cool addition to the lore here. You know, I thought the way the witch is fucking with him was much more visceral than it was in the first one. You know, I guess it's, I guess a bit like, you know, with, with like, with Saw, where you go, okay, well, we can do a mystery once, but after that, we have to go to the recurring thing, the recurring thing will be the traps. Hmm. I think in this one, we're going, well, we're, we can't really do a film where we don't show anything again. So why don't we do one where we just make it like, like a fucking roller coaster, you know, and, uh, and it's got far more overt scares than any of the other film than either of the other films. Yeah. Yeah. Any of them, I fucking exaggerate, but yeah, um, more than either of the others. Um, but I do think there was uh, again a bit of a scattergun approach where there's almost like so many of them, and like trees yeah. getting knocked over and things like it's yeah, yeah. And and funnily enough, going back to the roller coaster remark, sometimes it did feel like we were literally sat on one, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It's like just the camera just sometimes would spin out and there'd be a lot of screaming and just a lot of movement that just felt unnecessary. I know it's to build the tension. We can't see what's going on, so it's scarier. But again, it just felt like we were being obstructed more than anything rather than scared. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, what I noticed about this film, in the right ahead, Blair Witch 2 and 3 have an issue that the first one doesn't, and that I find myself questioning how much does this 18th century, how familiar is this 18th century witch with modern day camera technology? Mm. <laughs> because she seems to be quite fluent in it and knows how to uh, at least hide, knows to hide the tapes in the second <laughs> film. I don't know what else happened. Um, the like backing out of shot when the camera's on her. Like, I mean, the, the Blair Witch presumably knows what this is and how it operates. Who who sat down? I mean, did she attend a seminar? <laughs> uh, how does she know about the cameras and what their functions? But I, I like uh, maybe she saw the first one. I guess um, it, it was might be it might be if it's in one of this universe. But I I, I liked fit with the with um, her appearance because you bring in a bit of lore. If you go by by the way, her uh, her arms and legs were actually tied down with rocks. Right, and then that's what they bring in to uh, to give her this kind of slender man appearance, mm. you know, big, long, gangly arms. I just thought she, uh, that from what we see of her, she looked pretty cool. Yeah, like, that was a like, uh, bit of a what the fuck moment. <laughs> yeah, like when we reached the house again, there was just an immediate sense of dread and kind of mm. uh, like I don't know. I really enjoyed the familiarity of seeing that building again, Rusty yeah. Parr's house. But then, like you know, you see like her sort of poking in between the trees. Like, once they're in there, I just thought, like, the lighting, the mood, that was exactly what I wanted mm. yeah. in the movie. And, you know, it's still an over, overly, overly well, overwhelmingly, this is a... I, I've got positive things to say about this film. It's just... It makes you wait for the good bits. And yeah. uh, there's yeah. so much kind of wrong with a lot of the characterization. Like, there's almost no arcs in this. Oh, like, yeah, none. James, with this whole sort of... 
thing of, uh, you know, uh, there's potentially something here about the sort of identification with a sister that he doesn't really know anything about, right? And that should be some good human drama. It just isn't. You know, it doesn't really feel like he gives that much of a shit about it. Like, there's just... There's just kind of nothing to it dramatically. Yeah, it's, uh, like, the whole relationship just feels like it's there to tie it with the first film. And that's it. Other than the fact that they're retreading the steps. Mm. Yeah, it just feels like that has to be the anchor for yeah. it to have any relationship, I suppose. The first one's heart is like, with, you know, with Heather... There's something quite nice about seeing a filmmaker kind of out of her depth. She's trying to explore this local legend, and then there's a sort of hubris, and then she's like, she's she has a breakdown, like doubting herself here. You know, I I I've I've really fucked up with this. One really small bit that I did like was when they're struggling to build the tents in this, which is a good way of showing these guys have no yeah. idea what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and but again, it also just went to show how difficult it was to warm to the characters as well um the 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 the, the only interesting characters we do see um in it very much and the rest of the time is just a lot of running around being scared of noises for a while i mean it, all all the things people poked holes in the original for we got in this one Mm. I even though the original personally I thought was brilliant you know yeah there is a lot of running around and being scared of stuff but it's done in such a structured way that it works but in this one it feels like it's there to be I don't know, obtuse <laughs> stop us from getting to the, the money shots I suppose yeah. uh, just stretch things out a bit as you say once we get to the house that's when it really does get interesting it, it does more than just you know runs around looking for the missing person. It, it adds a lot to it. Yeah, this, like is, this is where I think the camera um, on the hat really works because it gives him a freedom to do, like, the claustrophobic tunnel sequences yeah. that you couldn't do for handheld, for example. I would like to see yeah. the tunnel sequence whilst I enjoyed I did enjoy them getting to the house at the end, having that drama there. But I found that the pacing dragged to a halt when she's crawling through that uh, underground tunnel. Oh, I just I love that. Yeah, I I, I, I thought it me. worked. Like it was horrible and claustrophobic, and you know, you, you thought it could have caved in at any moment. There was lots of noise going on around. And, uh, it also reminded me of another found footage film called The Borderlands. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Oh yes, um, uh, which the finale is very similar mm-hmm. to that moment. And, you know, I wasn't sure where it was going. I genuinely had no idea. It reminded me of uh, Frontiers has a very nice claustrophobic tunnel sequence. And, yeah, I think the, the first person, it looked great. Think of a cinema, actually. It occurs to me, first time I watched this, it was at a, uh, was at a press screening. So it was like a really large screen, a totally silent audience. And I think there, like, the kind of overwhelming noise that you got throughout it, like the kind of aggressiveness where you got like the uh, feedback every every few minutes or whatever, like I think it it was really cool be just being bombarded with stimulus particularly considering the first is such a slow burn you know, I really do applaud them for going down that route, else I just think it would be nice to have more to latch on to in terms of the characterization, in terms of what the point of the film is basically Um, yeah we'll just jump into a bit that I did enjoy during the, the forest jump scare sequence when they find themselves once again surrounded by stick figures. But some of them, one person grabs one of the stick figures, breaks it in half. Oh, yes. Yeah. The girl Talia, both her legs are broken and they bend up over her head. I love that. I really like that sequence. That was something new. Yeah. It was interesting. That was a shock. Oh, a bit, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's. that's... I think that was the part that made me sit up and go, oh, because up, up until this point, yeah. I did feel like we were just going through the motions. The implication um, as well is quite horrific. It means each oh. one of those stick figures represents either a has been yeah. victim or someone who will be a victim. Yeah, and like, and and the fact that it was one of the most interesting characters as well at this point. Yeah, yeah, Italian, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, basically, uh, I did like for that thing of them being the Burkittsville kids. So basically, her and Lane as being the total liabilities. 
<laughs> that was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, obviously they're fulfilling the uh, sort of the, the Roper role later on because mm. we're like, well, I mean, essentially he's going to become the antagonist. They've brought him in here with the intention of trying to fool them, basically. And uh, yeah, I think they were the best part um, of the movie by a fair margin, or the best part of the characters, at least. Mm. Uh, uh, anything else you want to say about this one, guys? The finale definitely saves the film. Yeah. Um, when they're in the, is it the attic, and they've got to face the corner, otherwise yeah, the, yeah. the witch will get them. And catching the witch on camera when she's yeah. trying to walk around as well. Like yeah, the... it was. I guess it was a very Clash of the Titans moment, a kind of a Medusa yeah. Yeah, moment. And uh, so she backs off, and then obviously... She thinks it's safe. Turns around. Ah, oh, yeah, come on! She, she Why did it. you do that? There's <laughs> also she was the last one, not James Donahue. Uh, she was the last one. Whereas because you think James Donahue's the one that's led everyone out there, I kind of feel he should have been the last victim of the Blair Witch. He should have survived the longest. Uh, maybe that was intentional, just to throw yeah, us off maybe. for a few seconds. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give it that actually. I'm... It seemed to sort of switch because I was expecting him to be uh, like, yeah, I was expecting, I was expecting that. So, good movie, basically in parts. I would mm, give this yes. one. Um, so in my original review, I gave it four stars. I don't stand by that any longer. It's the annoying thing of writing for a website is you, uh, you know, you got to progress the time. You have these reviews hanging over your head that you wrote, and you go, oh well, I'm 20, 2016 David was wrong. And um, basically, I will give this one three stars. And uh, you know, I think it's there's there's enough good in there that I would I would definitely recommend it to people. It's by some distance the second best Blair Witch film. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same yeah. time, yeah, three stars. I'm gonna agree with you again. Um, it's a three star film for me. There's stuff in it that I like, or stuff in it that I don't like. Um, but never quite does one of them win out. I wasn't fully won over by this film. Mm. Yeah. I see where you're coming from. I, I would say three, maybe three and a half a push, solely because it's the only one where I felt maybe a bit of dread for for a sustained period. <laughs> um, as good as the original is, I didn't really feel many scares or, or any tense moments. You know, I was just caught up in the drama, and it felt more like that to me than a scary film, whereas this one actually did have a bit of underlying dread in certain parts, especially the finale, which, you know, just as soon as we get there, just absolutely belts and goes for it. Um, so, yeah, I'd say three, three and a half. You well, know, I'll actually, go with three. I'm going to completely agree with you on something there. As long-term horror fans, one of the frustrating things is that you cease to find horror films very scary. Just larger because you can become so desensitized to them yeah. you know, I, fuck it, I would love to experience a lot of horror films for the first time like you know I'd love to rewatch The Shining for the first time for instance mm -hmm. you know I'd love to see something that scared me as much as it did or as much as, much as the first Blair Witch Project film did actually back in the day and I just don't get that feeling anymore but you're right I think with this one they do they do still create something at the end they really do create the sort of vibe that anything can happen here you know you've got little faces and faces showing up in the woods and you've had like fucking trees crumbling down and it's like pissing down the rain you know light random lights random noises it's really cool it's like a, it's like a, a ghost house basically and uh yeah i think i'm going to stick with three but i can i, I can see why three and a half you know because that is <clears throat> that's, a, that's a hell of an accomplishment in fact fuck it yeah i'm joining in three and a half <laughs> <laughs> i'm sticking with three <laughs> So, uh, let's move on. Welcome back. So, to round things off, we've reached our list, but to change the usual formula... It's going to be Jim who's picked out the list, so I won't be using my omniscient uh, sort of, ah, yes, look at these fools who's struggling to remember names <laughs> of films. You know, now I'm going to be one of these fools. So, uh, yes, what do you have for us today, Jim? In honour of Book of Shadows, Blair Wish 2, 
I was going to do the best new metal horror films. <laughs> But I thought I'd save the audience the displeasure of that. So I've gone for the top 10 disappointing horror sequels according to whatculture.com. Oh, can I ask, the, do you know what year this was from? Um, it's fairly recent. Uh, obviously, if I tell you some of the films, it's going to give yeah. away this. So, mm. um, but yeah, it's definitely from at least the last couple of years. Okay. Can I just say, as I mentioned this at the start of our... Uh, chat today tell me uh the exorcist to the heretic is on that list somewhere that must be on that list if it's not they've made a mistake well i can tell you they have made a mistake but in one of the film's titles but we'll get there so we've got okay. 10 okay now but exorcist heretic's not one of the 10 no it is oh, it's it's... Right. okay I, good I, okay so I, you're I, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, right. what, what, what ones can we toss at this? I take it we're not all part twos, no? Uh, no, um, I was trying to pinpoint it to all part twos, but no, we're, we're, we're being loose with the formula. It is any sequel. Blair Witch but 2 as is probably on there. Blair Witch 2 is on there. Book yeah. of Shadows is at number three. Oh. Uh, I reckon, although I love this film, Jaws 4 is probably on there. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are no Jaws films featured. Uh. But Surprise. I can see why, because Jaws 4 is still an entertaining film, despite it being diabolically shit. At some, <laughs> point, <laughs> at some point, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a Jaws show, it'll be awesome. Um, <laughs> Just not the first one. A <laughs> Jaws sequel show. Um, all right, so uh, what else has been a major letdown? Um, Just a sequel. Probably gonna be a paranormal activity one, possibly number, number six is a shit one. There are no paranormal activities mentioned. However, I will give you a clue to a couple of them. We have covered them on previous podcasts. Tell me once Hellraiser oh. 6. Oh, <laughs> You're close. Oh. I reckon the disappointing nine. one would be Hellraiser Eight or nine. I reckon it'll be part three with the disappointing one. Got it. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Although the wow. website actually said Hellraiser 2, reading the description, it was the third one. <laughs> Bastard. Yeah. So that is in at number nine. I mean... It's a good movie. But, uh, it is a good sure. movie. Uh, I can see why it would be a disappointing one, but not on the scale of Book of Shadows. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. No. Hannibal. Is Hannibal on there? Uh, Hannibal does not feature. Oh, does interesting. Does the Hannibal Rising feature? No, nothing uh, Silence of the Lambs okay. related or Hannibal Lecter related, I'm afraid. Number 10 is the sequel to a Wes Craven remake. Oh, Hills of Eyes Part 2. It is the Hills of Eyes Part 2 from mm. 2007. There was a weird bit of that, because it was Wes Craven and his son wrote it together. They got this really needless rape scene. They're just kind of imagining <laughs> father and son like sitting down, like, writing, his, <laughs> <laughs> writing this together. And he, he kind of Wes goes, like, all right, you take over the keys, or I'll go make some coffee or something. Yeah, <laughs> like, I can imagine just... when they're discussing that scene, father and son, I can imagine them not making eye contact. No. I, uh... <laughs> right, so number nine was always a free. Number eight, this actually surprised me because personally, I thought this was the better of the films. Um, yeah. It's uh, a sequel. Um, technically a remake of a TV movie, but also a book adaptation. Ooh. Oh, wait, it's not the, the sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep, is it? No, it's not Doctor Sleep, but you're on the right track with... The oh, wait, it's not it, it, it part two, is it? It is It Chapter 2. Uh, it Chapter 2 was a much better film than the first one. It was, yeah. <laughs> like, I, will st- I, will, I will fucking stand the hill in defence of that one. But I thought It Chapter 2 was ace. Oh, this isn't the only surprise in the list. <laughs> Next is a beloved 80s slasher series. Mm-hmm. Oh, Friday 13th, uh, we'll go with. For which one? Number five. That you... Number are, five is... you beginning, I reckon, yeah? I think it's that one. Nah. Oh, the fuck? Is this one... <laughs> like, uh, surely it's not one of the... It can't, be, it can't be earlier than five. No, it's not. It's later. Oh, Jason Takes Manhattan, number eight. Jason maybe. Takes Manhattan, Friday the 13th, <laughs> part eight. Understandable compared yeah. to the two that came before it. I personally really, really, good. really enjoyed that one. It was, it it was quite shit, but fun. fun. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, number six is the third in a franchise with another iconic killer. Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah, maybe Slasher. Uh, ooh, Scream Free? No, older, older than that. Uh, uh, oh, uh, some, well, oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, probably this will be. Yep, uh, Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Free. Uh, I mean, fair enough. I think it's not the weakest in the series. I'd be number four by a fair margin, but yeah, I suppose, I suppose the thing is disappointing implies his expectations. Hmm. Which by part four, <laughs> yeah. you, you wouldn't have yeah. expectations. So yeah, fair enough. Okay, so that was number six. At number five is a more recent film. Uh, I think it may be the third or fourth in the series. Uh, that's also had a couple of spin-offs as well. Oh, so this would be the Conjuring ones, probably the oh. first, the first Annabelle film. No, you're on, you're on the right series, but it's one of the main line. Oh, uh, series three. Wait, it's surely not the Conjuring two, right? The devil made me do it. Yeah, that's okay. The number three, yeah, that does suck. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, but like, it, yeah. it, it, it's weird to call that disappointing because you're like, well, the nun was already out before. The nun's not as good as it, right? <laughs> First <laughs> Annabelle's was... not, not as good either. The uh, I guess the nun and... or Annabelle isn't a sequel as such, though, are they? Mm. And yeah, Annabelle, Annabelle was pretty rubbish. But anyway, at number four, I think we may have done this as the third episode of the Horror Cult Films podcast. Oh, The Lost Boys, that will be, mm. I believe. Yeah. Ah, so this will be The Lost Boys Part 2. Lost Boys, The Tribe. Yeah, that's the first, that's the second one, right? Yeah. That's the yeah. second one. The first <laughs> is the third one. TH first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one with, uh, was it uh, Kiefer Sutherland's stepbrother or something? Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that, that was bad. Um, it was, <laughs> Uh, yeah, as we've uh, already covered, number three is Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2. So apparently, this next one is a worse film than all of the ones that we've already mentioned. Wow. Alien Free? Which Alien not... Free. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's no it's, I mean, it's no notab- notably a better film than Blair Witch 2, but, you know. Uh, I, I mean, said Alien Resurrection, but I, I wow. Guess if, I guess if Alien Free, though, uh, like, it's not... It's not a good film per se, but like it's, it, 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 I guess it's because it is following two absolute masterpieces. Yeah. Mm. In fact, like it seems, because I've always been disappointing as the term. You can, you, you know, that's that's what you go by. Like you wouldn't really yeah. go, ah, oh, yeah, I watched, um, I watched, um, like Blair Witch Project Three, and I was disappointed. Uh, Blair Witch Project Two, and I was disappointed. And it goes, did you expect it to be good? And you go, no. Whereas like Alien Three, I guess, like you're, fo- I mean. Alien Free, you're following up uh, two amazing movies, mm. and it kind of yeah. did dirty with the characters. So Blair Witch Two, for instance, it was yeah, a yeah. harder job. Um, I suppose, yeah. And although to be fair, like I personally am a fan of Alien Free, both the theatrical cut and the is it the work print version. Mm. I, I can watch either of those. I think yeah. both are great. Okay, so number one. What the fuck is this going to be? Um, this will be the most disappointing horror sequel of all time. Without, without you telling us what it is, do you reckon this deserves to be number one? Uh, to be honest, I have what I have seen of it. I haven't seen all of it, so I couldn't give a proper assessment, but uh, you have already mentioned it. What, t- today we've already mentioned it? Uh, a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's the one with the ones or something. <laughs> right. um, was the Insidious 3? Insidious 3 was all right. That's one of the better ones. <laughs> well, let's I mean, say this, it's this, a sequel to anything. one of the, you know, <laughs> most popular horror films ever made. Dr. Sleep. But uh, it's The Exorcist 2, the hooray. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about, I thought we covered it already. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, The Exorcist 2. <laughs> Uh, I mean, The Exorcist 2 is it's mind-bogglingly bad. I'll tell you what, uh, I, I'm surprised yeah. to make the list is the, the Descent Part 2. I'm surprised that wasn't on there. That was really pish. <laughs> no, I've not <laughs> seen that just, one. Descent, it just, it felt like an inferior copy of 1. I, I like was, Silent Hill 2. I was speaking to Neil Marshall at one point as part of an interview, and I, I asked him, by the way, uh, we weren't recording at this point, and I wouldn't have put this comment in the interview anyway. But um, I asked him, uh, "Is there ever going to be a descent free?" And he goes, 
I mean, you saw the second one. <laughs> 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 you know, um, yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, fair enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that was that was bad. The most well lit cave system in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what other ones? I, I thought Final Destination 5 was quite underwhelming. Um, a lot of people hate the fourth. I think the fourth is quite fun. I, th- I think if you just take the fourth as, a co- as an outright comedy, it's quite good. Yeah, I'm surprised the Candyman films haven't <laughs> appeared. I mean, It Chapter 2, come on. That, that For me, that was a five-star film. Yeah, I don't know if <laughs> I, I, I think it was four, it. but I mean, um, I mean, I'd actually probably quite like to do an Eta episode in future at some point, just because this mm-hmm. is an excuse to rewatch them. We have um, to cover the miniseries as well. Yeah, we could cover it. Happily, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen the miniseries since I was a kid, so yeah, gladly. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, like I thought, Eight Chapter Two was was ace. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe 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 on rewatch I'll hate it. But mm. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think with me, the, the issue that I had with the first one is, you know, Pennywise just came across as a bit incompetent. Like he was just kind of like, you know, he'd show up to do like, Ooh, like scaring the kids, but you're like, <laughs> but it's so action heavy that you're like, hang on, you've been chasing these kids for. Well, like ninety minutes of his runtime, and you've killed nobody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then because because the makers were embarrassed by the source material, I think they take out all the magic elements. So you're like, all right, so we're just going to beat mm. him to death with <laughs> bits of metal. <laughs> like it just, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't, I didn't care for it. The second one, I thought was a nice sort of balance between the kids and the adults. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was ace. Um, anyway, speaking of Ace, it's been Ace hanging out with you guys, talking about Blair Witch Project, uh, mm-hmm. Blair Witch, Blair, Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, and Blair Witch. Uh, folks, listen at home, we will be back at some point soon. Don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again. So, until then, it's a farewell from myself, and it's a farewell from these guys. Farewell. I'll see you later.